Hi. Um, first of all, I have to make a confess. It is about a week ago, I had a dream. Well, basically it was more like a nightmare. And I was dreaming that I was doing the speech of the opening speech of the symposium. And it was extremely long. It was extremely boring. And for some reason I couldn't stop. And so I have decided to, when I woke up all sweating and stuff, I decided to make it short and put it on paper. So that's why. And this is it. No, it's coming now, actually. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, dear students, or should I say, dear global photographic society. Welcome on the grand opening of our great event, the International Photography Symposium Pilsen. Our symposium has become so popular and has such a strong and long tradition that we actually forgot how long its history in fact is. Some of us declared that it is eight years. Some of us said it is nine years. Some believe it has always been there. Luckily, our dean has decided that next year it will be good time to celebrate the 10th anniversary. And of course, he's right. This means this year we can pre-celebrate next year's 10th anniversary. But what's more, we have the first anniversary of our symposium going online. Yes, this year uh, was full of sacrifices and probably the month to come will bring us some or lot of limitations as well. However, I feel that we, the organizers of the symposium, must be really grateful to the Wuhan pangolin eaters for confronting us with the evident truth. The times that the symposium was a meeting of friends who participated just for the fun without any high expectations are almost gone and it is evident that the symposium has overgrown its territory of the Pilsen metropolis. It has become a sheer necessity to go online and to meet the countless fans all over the world who wish to enjoy the best what the contemporary photography has to offer. That's why I say welcome to the new Global Photography Symposium. And uh, forgive me if I might have exaggerated a tiny little bit. Thank you for your attention. And now I pass the word to my dear colleague, Jan van Wunsel. Thank you, Wojciech Albrecht. Um, I will say in this introduction a couple of things about the exhibition, which uh, uh, the concept of the exhibition is, of course, also the concept of the uh, symposium. Um, Welcome to the ninth edition of Sudnarka's annual International Photography Symposium and Exhibition titled Boundaries, Poetics of Conflict. In today's global context, uh, political turmoil and the corona pandemic are uh, dominantly present. Each in their way, they contribute to challenging situations of protests and lockdowns both of which caused our personal and societal boundaries to be subjected to unpredictability. This year, we are communally affected by a string of awe-evoking events that call life as we know it into question. From fighting a stealth virus through quarantining to taking a stand against political corruption by marching the streets, boundaries have seldomly appeared so 
confrontational. The process of defining, evaluating and redefining boundaries is significant. The dynamic tension that exists between the act of setting boundaries and their inevitable, sometimes uh, immediate transgression touches upon the paradoxical nature of life. For all kinds of reasons, boundaries are redrawn at some point in time. They are destined to transition and temporary in effect. The artworks presented in this international group exhibition sort of move in orbit around this mentioned evolution. Consequently, they each confess to certain poetics of conflict. The exhibition, Boundaries, Poetics of Conflict, shows, shows artworks that imagine the accidental or intended collisions of geographical borders, the periphery, history and politics, language and misinterpretations, uh, digitalization and glitches, space colonization and human sacrifice, togetherness and alienation. The International Group Exhibition brings together the work of emerging and established artists from the Czech Republic, Taiwan, the USA, Israel, Belarus, the Netherlands and Finland. Each of the participants take an individual and unique approaches to the theme of boundaries in their artistic practice. And as you know, the exhibition was and still is uh, until today, the last day, in our Ladislav Sudnar gallery. Uh, and because of course the, the, the situation is quite difficult to uh, visit the exhibition, we couldn't uh, do a public opening. And that is why the, the team of multimedia, uh, together with me, created an online exhibition that you can walk through um, at any time. I will now introduce the first speaker of today. The first speaker of today's symposium is Hinek Alt. Hinek studied at the Department of Photography at FAMU in Prague. He completed the postgraduate visual research lab program at the State University of New York at New Paltz, where he studied with the support of a Fulbright scholarship. He is the leader of the Studio of Photography and New Media at FAMU, and he exhibited his work in New York, Berlin, Prague, Paris, Ljubljana, Oslo, Vienna, and of course, uh, Pilsen. Hinek, it is a pleasure to have you with us this morning, and it has been a pleasure to work with you in the context of the exhibition Boundaries, Poetics of Conflict. The three installations that you contributed to the exhibition take us from the failed launch of the Challenger space mission to the city's exposed underground network of pipelines to Los Angeles. I'm looking forward to your elaboration and welcome you to start your presentation. Okay, does it work now? Can you hear me? Yes, now we have sound. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you very much for this warm um, invite. Um, the audio seems to be looped. Can you, can you turn off your mic? I'm getting a feedback loop there. Okay. Still. I can hear myself two seconds after I say something. Is it fine now? No, I can still hear myself.
Is that good now? Yes, it seems to be good. Um, okay, thank you very much for this warm invite. Uh, thank you, Jan. Thank you, Wojciech. Um, uh, um, uh, definitely a pleasure to be part of this. Uh, um, I'm going to uh, briefly talk about two exhibitions, uh, and I would like to arrive at the presentation that I've pre prepared together with Jan for Vladislav Sutnar Gallery. Um, I will uh, just briefly introduce my uh, practice. So as Jan mentioned, I, I have uh, originally studied um, photography and photography is somehow quite uh, central to whatever I uh, work with, but I uh, try to work with photography exclusively in the context of fine art. Um, um, that means I also use photography as a departure point. Uh, very often arriving at the installation um, objects, uh, um, uh, 3D simulation video. Um, I will try to mirror the... Um, Okay, um, so as I said, I've, uh, I've decided to present two exhibitions. Uh, one uh, that is currently on the show, the show is called How Soon Is Now. It's a show that uh, was heavily affected, uh, unfortunately, by the uh, quarantine. So it, mm, most people, I, I assume, actually saw it in documentation. Uh, the exhibition somehow summarize, summarizes a lot of my uh, current uh, topics uh, or methods that I'm using. Uh, it's uh, comprised of um, uh, four uh, projects that are in different stages of um, um, sort of process. Uh, uh, I would like to go through each one of the projects. Um, um, uh, later on, I will also introduce an older show. Um, that actually um, included the uh, challenger shots, um, and then I will uh, try to connect that with the with the image of Los Angeles uh, that you might have uh, seen. Uh, so, how soon is now? Uh, is a show that I opened in um, uh, October. The show uh, takes the title from the Smith song "How Soon Is Now." Um, it doesn't actually use the. Mm, the content or the mm, um, um, any of the lyrics, it it only sort of introduces the song as a um, as a way of uh, uh, dealing with certain sentiment or mm, perhaps even melody. Uh, the show is a, a spatial installation of four projects. Uh, first, I would like to introduce. Uh, uh, these shots, these are um, shots of uh, infrastructure landscape. So these are holes in the street. Um, I've uh, worked on this project for um, about four years now uh, in various degrees of intensity. Um, so it's really a collection of uh, uh, older shots and new shots. It's a very photographic work. Um, I've used the method of, um, and I, I think a lot of inspiration from the um, uh, situationist movement uh, uh, from uh, 70s. I was interested in the idea of derive as a, as a way of exploring city. This means like a pointless walk, uh, wandering through the uh, street, not knowing what you will discover, not knowing where you go. Uh, in the same moment, I, I was trying to focus on a um, mm, uh, very photographic way of uh, looking at uh, reality. Um, I was curious uh, how you can uh, document something so complicated, like the um, mm, really abstract hole in the ground where uh, there's no uh, mm, um, clear focus. It's all 
just tangled up. Uh, it's uh, kind of random. Um, uh, the infrastructure that you see uh, everywhere is uh, sort of scattered. It seems um, um, it doesn't appear as making any sense, any, um, any sort of um, um, system. Uh, yet it obviously is there. So um, the infrastructure, uh, the pipes, uh, the cables, uh, the internet, uh, electricity, uh, water, sewage, uh, gas, all of this became sort of central point. Um, um, again, it's a vis visual research. I was trying to think about uh, this project as a, as a way of documenting sculpture as a way of documenting something that exists very much in a three-dimensional world, uh, something that uh, uh, necessarily is extremely spatial, and in the same moment, something that is very much hidden. Um, so I was using this uh, holes uh, as a way of looking at something that opens for, a, for a, a fraction of time, something that is open only for the necessary uh, moment to actually be repaired or replaced or um, made new or um, yeah, so on. Um, I was uh, super much interested in thinking in terms of uh, uh, how um, uh, sculpture works. Uh, this means uh, sculpture as something uh, like a material um, uh, form for uh, an idea. Uh, so I was trying to project this thinking into then documenting uh, these holes. Um, the method was very simple. It was very uh, documentary uh, method uh, where I was trying to um, capture as much as possible. In the same moment, I was avoiding um, a horizon and quite often uh, I was avoiding uh, actually giving away where it's uh, where uh, up or down or left and right is. So I was very much curious in seeing how um, abstract these holes can become. Uh, uh, this uh, project is now being finalized as a book. Uh, the book is going to be probably introduced next week. So it's a sort of last minute uh, Christmas present. <laughs> um, I, um, um, I've decided to actually uh, present the project in the book in a form of a series of uh, about 57 images. Uh, the um, uh, number is quite arbitrary, but definitely I was trying to uh, find a large volume of images. Uh, I was uh, curious in uh, creating a um, um, body of work that doesn't actually have uh, um, like um, stars or um, the best pictures, uh, um, they are all supposed to be sort of uh, interchangeable. Uh, there is no uh, hierarchy to the images. And also there is no ma methodology in, the, in, the, in what it's depicting. So it's, uh, it's really um, usually showing uh, just scrambled pieces of anything that was there. For me, uh, it was quite important to uh, think about infrastructure as a key um, um, theme of the whole exhibition. Uh, so um, infrastructure as an idea of uh, uh, sort of a, um, a social body or body of society, something that we that is underneath the surface, something that we don't realize. Uh, we all use it, obviously. Uh, uh, we all live actually plugged onto um, uh, different modes of infrastructures. Um, I've deliberately chosen the, the, these physical forms, uh, even if I'm aware that there are many other um, elements of infrastructure. So these are these really physical um, bodies of infrastructure that literally uh, bind the society. They function as organs or intestines of society. Uh, um, I've decided to actually present these or, um, in two ways. One you just saw, one was the, uh, the presentation of the newspaper. Uh, um, uh, it's a pile of newspaper carefully um, sort of um, stacked up uh, 
to function as a um, as an installation piece, as a as a really physical element in the exhibition, almost architectural. Um, the other one was uh, where these uh, large uh, billboard prints. Again, billboard. Uh, it's obvious. It's a it's a cheap uh, um, way of printing. Uh, even if the quality has gone dramatically up, I um, uh, I assume that no one actually thinks about these in terms of uh, uh, um, quality or uh, um, um, any kind of. Um, uh, um, they, uh, they are not uh, uh, understood as as precious prints. Uh, but uh, then again, I was I was super much curious in actually using the facility of the billboard printing as well as the newspaper printing. Again, this is another mode of um, infrastructure that we use and that is perhaps disappearing now. Uh, the, um, I will just quickly go back to this. Uh, uh, so the newspapers are extremely interesting to me. Uh, they contain uh, a lot of meaning by themselves. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a circulating thing, something that is being made every day. Uh, something that actually uh, contains narratives um, that are um, that are extremely influential. Um, uh, again, it has um, mm, um, super deep uh, political meaning itself. Uh, this particular uh, newspaper is actually printed in uh, uh, the printing house uh, Mafra, which is. Uh, a printing house that produces the daily Edness. No, sorry, Dnes, Mada Fronta Dnes. So it's a it's a main Czech daily uh, that is owned by our uh, current uh, prime minister. Uh, so it it has um, um, it has this uh, uh, funny uh, depth of uh, its own politics. Uh, in the same moment, it is uh, quite interesting to realize that. Uh, uh, newspaper printing is at uh, its, uh, um, I don't know, 15% of its uh, original uh, volume. Uh, so people don't read newspaper anymore. Um, it's uh, simply disappearing. Uh, as we all know, the um, uh, web portals uh, of different news uh, media are um, uh, developing um, in an uh, uh, amazingly rapid pace. Uh, and uh, it, it is quite imaginable that newspapers will uh, very soon just disappear altogether. So I was, uh, I was super much interested in this um, physicality and um, in, the, in the centrality of the um, newspaper as such. Uh, uh, again, um, even with the billboard prints, I was trying to emphasize the physicality of the prints. Uh, uh, I was trying to even um, sort of point out that there is a backside to these prints. So I've, uh, I've printed a pattern on the backside just to make sure that everyone understands that there is a backside, that it's got um, um, a strong material substance. Okay, um, so the exhibition, as I said, the exhibition introduced four different projects. Uh, one of them were, were these shots uh, of infrastructures presented in two uh, modes, let's say. Um, there was another project that I'm just starting to work on and uh, um, uh, it sort of um, circles around the idea of uh, culture infrastructure, something that uh, uh, is very much physical, so it's uh, it um, mm, it shows uh, sculpture in public space, uh, and um, uh, for this particular project, I have chosen uh, as a source archive of um, uh, the City Gallery of Prague. Uh, I have uh, chosen images that um, I'm just going to play this. I have chosen images that. Uh, show plain documentation of uh, installation or 
removal of different sculptures that are managed by the City Gallery uh, of Prague. Um, these images uh, show uh, a moment when the sculpture uh, turns into an event. So the installation or removal of the sculpture is uh, uh, an instant thing. It's a it's a news uh, uh, it's a breaking news uh, event. Uh, something that uh, either installs or removes certain ideology. Again, if we think about sculpture as as a, a sort of material um, position of an idea, uh, these are very much about uh, changing the paradigm, about uh, um, retelling the story, about uh, making a full stop in the narrative. Um, uh, I was, of course, interested in this uh, documentary vis visuality of, the, of these images, but um, I wanted to somehow make sure that they actually unified. And um, so I've decided to um, work with a, a simple tool of digital collage and I've cut them out of the environment. I've uh, uh, corrected all of their positions to to whatever they, however they intended to be, so that they their up is up uh, and so on. Uh, this uh, caused everything else to sort of turn around or turn sideways. Um, um, uh, I've used also um, most of the documentation was black and white, but there were also some pictures in color. Uh, but uh, together with my colleague, uh, who actually is an expert in um, new technologies, so we have developed this simple uh, mechanism that um, uses um, e-ink display and a small computer that is able to change these images. So it's, um, it's again, uh, um, a strong position in the, in the media. I was trying to uh, work with something that is very current. The e-ink display is used in um, 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 every Kindle or every every e-reader that you, um, you know. Um, it's um, for me. It it very much um, emphasizes the the current uh, technological development. Uh, the e-ink uh, display itself is quite interesting because it's actually a physical display. There are uh, tiny moving parts inside the display that sort of flip uh, according to what current um, um, there is. Uh, so um, it has, uh, again, very material substance, but it's um, digitally controlled. Um, uh, so um, the interesting quality of the e-ink display is that even if you turn off the electricity, it actually stays on. It's a, it's a physical... Um, um, like a physical display that um, uh, shows. So again, it's a different position um, in the whole exhibition in terms of media, but uh, where I feel it strongly connects with the infrastructure is that it, it actually shows a similar moment of, uh, of sort of uh, adjusting the, um, um, the narrative. This, this could mean that there is a, uh, it could be uh, sort of metaphorically similar to the idea of uh, repairing pipes or cables in the ground. Um, this takes us to another project that was part of the show, and it's uh, um, it's called uh, Untitled Spable Ketamine. Um, uh, it's actually a project closely related to Pilsen, which I'm happy to share with you. Um, uh, it shows a puppet of uh, Spable, um, uh, Spable is a puppet from 1920. It was developed by, or it was in, uh, back then. They, uh, I suppose, they didn't develop ideas. They, they just had ideas. So it was an idea by Josef Skupa, who um, uh, asked his colleague uh, uh, Karel Novsek to uh, uh, create a wooden puppet of uh, a city. A uh, guy, a slacker who um, is extremely cynical, um, uh, who doesn't, uh, hmm, who's lazy, who uh, thinks he's a smart ass, but he is actually uh, a constant um, uh, joke for everyone. Uh, he's uh, extremely clumsy. He's dressed uh, in this uh, hmm, 
sort of black, old, uh, hand-me-down, black tie um, uh, thing that is supposed to resemble 19th century. So the puppet was created in 1920 when the, the whole idea of 19th century was very much present. Um, uh, in the local context, it also meant uh, um, uh, that there was a lot of sentiment against the uh, monarchy that just um, sort of uh, dissipated um, uh, two years uh, two years before that. Um, uh, it was a guy who uh, was a simple target. Uh, the funny thing with this puppet is that it actually sustained itself somehow. Somehow the theater revolving around Spabel um, uh, survived all the way up till today. The um, mm, the narrative of uh, uh, Spabel then became more complicated because they, he sort of uh, he was pushed in the, into the background by his uh, um, character son uh, Hurvinek, and uh, um, he he was no longer the main uh, character in the in most of the stories. Uh, however, the whole idea of Spabel as such survived until today. But um, I suppose that uh, the the um, the whole idea somehow emptied it, itself. Uh, so now it's a children uh, theater, uh, and uh, I would say quite popular. But in the same moment, not not um, not necessarily very progressive. Mm. Uh, I was curious to look at uh, the character uh, that it really depicts and. Um, I kind of felt pity for the character, felt pity for the uh, simplistic take on uh, um, someone's position. Uh, I was trying to see if there's a way to actually work all of a sudden in a very different way with a puppet uh, that has fixed um, positions, fixed um, sentiment. Uh, so um, uh, with a couple of my colleagues, we scanned the original puppet, uh, we put it into 3D, we recreated the joints and um, I, uh, using uh, motion capture software and hardware, I, I actually dressed myself into the, into the puppet. So I, I became the puppeteer. But um, I was trying to figure out how to work with the conscience or how to work with the, with the idea of uh, control and um, how... Uh, we can uh, loosen the grip, how we can uh, perhaps uh, uh, set the puppet free or freer than um, uh, as we know it. Uh, so um, for, for this particular video that has uh, um, uh, in total about hour and a half, uh, I have uh, taken um, um, a moderate dose of ketamine, which is a recreational drug uh, used for weekend parties and so on. Um, originally, it was used uh, as anesthetics uh, uh, for animals. Uh, so it, co it causes this uh, sort of uh, sleepy uh, a loss of uh, 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 loss of uh, control, loss of uh, awareness of your surroundings. So basically you forget who you are, perhaps where you are. Um, and uh, so while intoxicated, I was controlling this puppet. We have recorded the whole thing. Uh, you saw a, um, a little snippet of the whole thing now. It actually shows the moment where I don't know that I am myself and it I definitely don't know that I'm actually controlling a puppet. Um, uh, I was really happy with the text, uh, exhibition text, which was uh, written by Boris Salai, a uh, Hungarian theorist. Um, and she's, uh, she's describing exactly this process of uh, losing consciousness in order to free the, uh, the body, in the sense, someone else's body, and the failure to do so. so I, I understand that um, um, even if I intoxicate myself, it doesn't actually set the puppet free, but it definitely changes something in the puppet's uh, um, behavior. 
and I imagine something in the puppet's experience. And it also changes the way the puppet presents itself. Suddenly there are no jokes. It's a, it's, it sort of uh, stares into the blank, into the void, uh, which I feel like is a new experience for the puppet. Uh, back to the infrastructures, this was again an, an attempt to think about uh, um, sort of um, uh, m some of the key uh, elements in um, culture infrastructures as we know them. So um, um, a character that has been with us for uh, 100 years is, a, is, a, is an important part of the uh, culture narrative. And it's always behaved the same. Uh, I was trying to change that. I was trying to sort of fix uh, his position. These are some of the uh, installation shots again. Uh, the last project uh, that I'm going to present in the context of this exhibition is this poster. And it takes us again to um, um, the idea of uh, uh, printing offset. Um, for this particular project, I've chosen uh, uh, to uh, do a portrait of a um, fairly successful, famous uh, Czech porn actress. Um, uh, her stage name is Lady D. Um, she uh, she is, uh, I think, 23. Uh, she's had uh, an extremely successful porn career. Uh, in the same moment now, she's expecting a family, so she's quitting the business. She's going to be become a uh, her own producer. She's not going to act in the um, uh, mm, in the porn movies anymore. Uh, so the idea here was. Uh, Again, to work with the infrastructure, something um, underlying, something hidden under the surface, something that uh, uh, there's of obviously a, an extremely complicated um, discussion around pornography. I wasn't necessarily trying to go into a critique of pornography. I was much more interested in looking at something that is just below the surface, something that is quite intimate uh, uh, or perhaps um, private. And um, I was trying to basically change the medium. So from something that we are used to uh, see on um, screens that are perhaps uh, small or even smaller, because again, it's a private thing. Uh, I was trying to create a poster, something that, that could resemble posters from 70s showing sexy French singers. So um, my idea was to actually change the uh, to shift, um, to simply shift uh, the medium that we uh, uh, might be surprised to find a portrait of porn actress on. Again, there's a strong element of this thinking about uh, uh, something as poster or a stack of posters, uh, which uh, essentially is the work. Uh, uh, so the work is not the portrait, neither the uh, individual posters, uh, ne neither the individual poster, but the whole stack. And the stack is intended for uh, people to, to be taken away. Uh, so um, essentially, I feel uh, for me, the, the work uh, itself is, is actually the, the act of taking the posters, the, the slowly disappearing, uh, disappearance, and this uh, redistribution into some sort of physical cloud. Um, also this kind of fragility of the whole thing. So some people might take it home and appreciate it, uh, looking at it on the wall. Uh, some people will actually just, mm, I don't know, um, um, discard the poster. So uh, there's certain, uh, I guess the, uh, the cheapness um, uh, or the whole economy of um, just giving it and taking it uh, is also connected uh, with certain fragility, with certain, in insecurity of what's going to happen with Boston. So now I want to go back. Uh, I don't know how we're doing time-wise, actually. I think we're fine-ish. Uh, so I want to go back to um, a show called Deep Purple that I did at the uh, Lucia de Dova Gallery in 2017. Um, it was again a show comprised of uh, um, uh, three um, other projects. I'm just gonna show a snippet. Uh, so <clears throat> it's, uh, 
in in this case, I just want to focus on uh, uh, part of the show where I've exhibited uh, uh, posters, again, intended to be taken away by the visitors, uh, that show four different shots of uh, Challenger. So Challenger uh, was this tragedy in 1986. Uh, it was, um, um, yeah, here we can see it. So Challenger was this tragedy from 1986 uh, when the Americans launched the new uh, space shuttle called Challenger and um, it exploded um, about 30 seconds after it, uh, it was launched. Uh, it created this uh, mesmerizing cloud, this sort of uh, spectacular show that has this super bitter and sad uh, background. Um, so I was, um, uh, I actually remember this uh, event from uh, when I was little and um, it was shocking. I, uh, I couldn't understand. It, it was more shocking even if this was an American rocket, because uh, I was looking at the whole scene from the other side of the Iron Curtain. So I was, I was really shocked, not just by the tragedy of the whole event or um, uh, the failure, but also the idea of the Americans uh, actually not managing to launch the mm, ship. Uh, but then again, I was when I was looking at it now, I was uh, curious about this uh, abstract essence of the image. Uh, um, so the explosion is an event when when something changes instantly, something that we cannot we cannot perceive how uh, from a, a, like a very physical and firm object like a rocket so, suddenly there's only a cloud. Uh, um, and of course this is what the uh, photographers shot. They didn't, uh, they had one chance. They could just aim and shoot. Uh, there was no control over the whole thing. So rocket as such is an extremely uh, controlled enterprise. There is a whole um, um, uh, uh, full room of um, engineers and technicians and I don't know what, uh, who control the launch, uh, control the rocket, control the engines, uh, communicate with the pilots or uh, the astronauts. Uh, uh, in the same moment, suddenly the rocket something very physical some, uh, very physical something very specific crafted uh, uh thought out changes into this abstract cloud uh we have no control over this cloud and the cloud has a completely random shape mm. uh of course it's got uh, i i i feel like it's uh, it's rich met with metaphors in in a sense of the uh, the shape and um and the show that it put on display. Uh, there was another um, layer to the project. I actually couldn't obviously get these images differently than buy them. Um, I could not have taken them. So I bought them through Getty Images. I was really curious to go through the mainstream thing and actually buy them off the agency. Uh, that is sort of, um, um, so Getty Images started as a Getty family dealing with oil and then eventually moving to media. I find this completely intriguing, uh, the idea of images being, or images and videos being right after business with oil. I find this extremely mm, symptomatic for today. Um, and are we arriving at the, at the images from the uh, boundaries exhibition? Um, uh, we worked with Jan on um, sort of um, changing the whole installation and um, adding completely new element. And this was a shot of uh, Los Angeles. Again, the strategy is quite similar. So I have um, I have actually acquired this image through Getty. Uh, in this case, I also have a caption with the full name of the photographer um, and uh, um, it's an 80s uh, aerial uh view of los angeles with um some of the buildings uh with uh, uh with clearly visible smog uh with a kind of gloomy atmosphere i was really interested in this contrast of the um uh, imagination again 80s uh for me los angeles was this uh, sort of paradise idea of the 
the west, further most west, um, 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 uh, something associated with wealth and um, happiness and uh, uh, perhaps luck. Uh, um, the image doesn't look any um, uh, like anything like that. It's it actually shows a, a quite grey uh, city uh, again with a with a thick smog. Um, uh, that was an obvious problem in eighties in Los Angeles. Um, and it um, suddenly creates this uh, uh, position for all these challenger shots. So it, it uh, of course, challenger didn't um, start from uh, uh, Los Angeles, but uh, it sort of uh, it suddenly creates a geographical pinpoint for the for the uh, for the challenger. Um, I think I'm going to finish here. Yeah. Yep. I think we are. Uh, okay, uh, Hinek. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so so much. Um, this is a good moment, actually, for the the students in our live audience to uh, speak up to have uh, some questions for mm -hmm. uh, Hinek based on his presentation. Do we have any questions? Um, yes, they're, but they're, they're very quiet, very quiet. Um, Hello, audience. Uh, Hineg, during uh, your uh, presentation, um, I was thinking a lot suddenly about this, this let's say, maybe um, idea of, maybe I want to call it disappearance. Um, you you work a lot with this idea of the non-permanence. Um, let's say that in the the context of the the holes the, the, that expose the infrastructure of the city, you at some point you call it uh, you know I, 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 it's a way of documenting temporary sculptures, uh, mm -hmm. and that they appear to us like in a in a moment of time and then they basically disappear again when the the the, the problem is fixed and the concrete goes back on on top of them um, mm -hmm. the same thing occurred to me when you were talking about uh, a newspaper as a disappearing uh, format for printing and distribution of uh, of news um, it also occurred to me when when you uh, spoke about uh, the challenger, how it sort of transforms from a from a carefully constructed um, uh, space shuttle into smoke, debris, uh, fire, uh, all the things that uh, that happened in 1986 that we saw on the the news. Mm -hmm. um, can you perhaps say something a bit more about this uh, this idea of the the non permanent uh, disappearance? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, fragility, insecurity, these are words that you mentioned. It also yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, reminded me of the idea of uh, undirected distribution, like your work in fact is mm -hmm. uh, placed in such a way uh, that invites the visitor to take it home so that it disappears. Yeah, very good question, super uh, super intriguing. I, I would maybe give credit to, I was, since ever I was a uh, a uh, big fan of uh, Felix Gonzalez Torres, uh, um, um, an essential um, uh, f uh, figure of New York art scene. Who actually, for me, he invented the idea of posters. Uh, he actually worked with quite different idea um, in terms of uh, all the all the sentiment that he was using. Um, it was a generation of artists strongly associated with the, with the HIV um, epidemic uh, or pandemic, or I don't know uh, which one it was then. Uh, uh, and uh, he actually uh, worked a lot with institutions, working with the posters, working with the idea of uh, the, um, uh, the individual, posters being just given away uh, in the same moment I, I I did my research there and I have realized they actually he always uh, asked the institutions to keep printing uh, there was 
was this uh, idea of um, um, never-ending supply. Uh, and um, when I thought about his work and I thought about my positions, I was, um, as much as I uh, strongly appreciate his uh, um, his thinking, I realized that this is not, this doesn't describe my uh, experience because I, um, mm, so uh, East European uh, practices are often um, uh, strongly influenced by the economy, uh, by the, uh, or by the la uh, lack thereof, uh, uh, by improvisation. Um, so I, uh, I realized that the idea of uh, the disappearing pile, something that uh, is uh, once given and then it's uh, then it slowly slowly vanishes. I I thought that this was qu actually quite important part that you it, it cannot it cannot uh, be supplied forever. There's just no there's just no haha infrastructure for that. Um, uh, meaning that. Uh, uh, the institutions are not actually able to uh, provide you with that idea, but uh, then I realized that it's a part of the quality of the work, uh, this this sort of uh, uh, different life of the work. So um, for me, then it became really intriguing um, to think, when is the work finished? When do I, when do I, how, how do I define when I lose control over the work. So I start by installing a stack of images in the gallery. Um, is that the work? No, it's, it needs the participation. It of course needs people to come and take a look or perhaps take, take the posters and some of them will put them um, um, at the wall at home. Some of them will not. Uh, so the work uh, needs to be disappearing to actually be fulfilled. Uh, and then some of the posters that I've done over the years have disappeared already altogether. So I perhaps have uh, just a couple of um, a couple of uh, posters left. Um, and then I'm thinking, is that the moment when when this whole work finishes? Is that the case of uh, really well done documentation of the exhibition? Is that is that is the essence of the work in the documentary? No, not really. So I really like this ambiguity. It's super simple. The whole the whole idea is very simple. But I like this uh, um, ambiguity. This sort of this um, you uh, uh, it's it's a quality that you cannot grasp. Uh, and of course, uh, there's a, um, a substantial conflict. So. It's an image, but it has this extremely physical presence or physical absence in this case. Um, does it make sense? To, to me, to me, it does uh, make sense. Uh, but there's there's another um, sort of layer that I was thinking about. Um, because you you speak about um, you know the the importance is some, something like from you know an ambiguous point of view like uh, it's uh, about this disappearance and uncontrol uh, an un sort of uncurated distribution of your work um, and you question sort of like when is you sort of question when is the artwork which is very very interesting to me yeah um, mm -hmm. in the in the work that you introduced. Um, with uh, the puppets, uh, I also had to think about control, and you mentioned it yourself, control and failure. Uh, but there, there mm -hmm. sort of it, it becomes something like an, an identification with this uh, puppet, with this character. I believe you uh, mm -hmm. you mentioned that the, the this specific uh, character was um, created to be in uh, 100 years ago, I believe 1920. You said. Uh, created to be some kind mm -hmm. of a protagonist, but then over time it became more and more of an extra, like not such an important character in uh, in the, the the puppet plays. Mm -hmm. I might be wrong, but there's another kind of uh, layer um, or kind of uh, another type of disappearance from being a protagonist to going sort of you know to the side of a stage, like being an extra. Um, this project actually re reminded me uh, strongly uh, to. 
uh, the, the, the project of Pierre Week and Philippe Pareno when they uh, sort of saved the character Anne Lee from a manga story uh, created by a Japanese uh, manga company. Uh, and this character Anne Lee was designed to sort of die in one, in one of the stories of a, of, a, of a manga cartoon. And Pierre and Philippe decide to buy the rights to this character and introduce mm. her uh, into an art into the art scene mm. where she would have mm -hmm. uh, a different kind of life and she she appeared in sort of like a digital sphere uh, not really knowing what she is where she is uh, it's a, the project no ghost just a shell I, I'm sure you know it it was uh, it's yeah, a yeah, long yeah. time ago mm -hmm. I think it was mm -hmm. in Eindhoven in uh, 2002 or 2003 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so there's this, this idea of control and failure of control but at the same time, I think there's a contrast because um, you sort of recuperate images, let's say, from the challenger uh, that are mm -hmm. in some way already um, lost, completely distributed, uh, and, and sort of you know sit in the memory of us. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what, 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 what's the question then? What would be the... Um I think it was no question. <laughs> <laughs> it's more an, okay. uh, an extra observation. But mm -hmm. yeah. hi, Hinek. So maybe I do have hi. a question. I um, mm -hmm. I was wondering about um, uh, like you are talking uh, like looking for the definite or indefinite. Uh, uh, form of your exhibits or your uh, your photography mm -hmm. and I was wondering about uh, your project about the infrastructure about the pits and um, you are talking about the book and I find really the the, the images in itself uh, very uh, what kind of beautiful and intriguing um, mm -hmm. and I wonder about the layers which you uh, feel you have to add or you you do at, at exhibitions, because probably in the book, I expect the images as more or less as they are. And in the, in the, during the exhibitions, you kind of turn them into, into objects. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the question is where, uh, is so, it like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. like mm -hmm. uh, looking at, uh, at the possibilities of the image uh, and, and the content and, and the communication mm -hmm. with, uh, mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah this is super interesting for me because I, uh, uh, I thought I, I thought about it a lot now, and uh, especially with the with the. I mean, the book is literally being finished today. It should be. It should actually be uh, delivered tomorrow. So it's really. Uh, it's a uh, we're at the end of uh, the whole project now. Uh, so yes, it's a it's a super in, important question, and I would say that the whole. Uh, the whole idea of this, uh, like different modes of uh, presentation, are actually influenced by me not knowing what to do with it. Uh, uh, yes, I agree. I'm also intrigued by the images. I actually enjoy enjoyed taking them a lot. There was a lot of lot of energy that I invested into taking these pictures. But then, it, I mm, I honestly um, uh, started working with it uh, uh, in processual way. So I I didn't know what was going to be the, f the final form. Uh, I always deal with this uh, conflict of digital photography and how that should be actually presented. So um, I'm always trying to think like, is this, uh, what is the right way um, to present digital photography? Uh, and I would say that I uh, exclusively work with digital photography. I feel it's important to work with whatever is around right now. So I avoid, uh, but this might be just my thing that I, I, I don't like um, the uh, analog uh, darkroom and uh, all of the processes. I'm, I, I was just never a fan of that. So I, I, uh, whenever I, I deal with, uh, uh, with um, uh, trying to show images that are essentially digital, I always stumble and i'm 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 always thinking like what is the way so maybe this offset print is actually an industrial standard oh maybe book is perfect uh, so, um, sort of uh, um, um, 
uh, channel that I should use. And so um, uh, then I end up uh, trying all of these positions. I, I really like uh, working with screen also, not in this, uh, not in this uh, case uh, though. But then with the book, we, we actually figured out, I did the book with, uh, with my colleague, with Jen Kratochvil, who is a curator, and he became editor of the book. And there we came up with this idea that uh, these images, they don't actually, um, even if they are very descriptive, they don't actually show anything. They, uh, some of the people, I actually uh, met a collector two years ago, uh, a collector of uh, art who happens to have a company, among other things, he happens to have a company which deals with the uh, um, gas pipelines. Uh, so he could recognize some of the gas pipelines in the images, uh, which was quite amusing, but uh, uh, that's not the point. So it's not trying to show anything specific. And with the book, we were trying to really emphasize this whole idea of uh, sort of images um, being quite abstract, even if they are extremely descriptive. And we have asked uh, four different writers, I mean, including Jan Kratochvil. Um, we have asked a curator, uh, um, a Spanish, uh, English uh, uh, curator, Angels, uh, Angels Meralda, who was looking at the idea of the underground. So whatever is, uh, is below our surface and what we have feared over the centuries. Uh, then we've asked uh, Yusi Parika, who's a media uh, theorist, um, and he he was dealing with this idea of opening and closing the ground, as uh, as um, as in media theory. So really looking at at the physical world, sort of opening and closing on us. And then we have asked um, uh, 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 Gianfranco Sanguinetti, who is a uh, uh, this uh, one of the situationists who happens to actually live in Prague because he married uh, his last uh, wife is uh, Czech. So he he lives in Prague. He's very old now, mm, and um, because the work was very much inspired by the situationist uh, manifesto, um, uh, well, we've uh, tried to talk to him about it, um, um, and uh, he uh, he wrote a text. Uh, that is not perhaps about the situationist movement at all. It's much more about uh, some sort of uh, um, frustration and skepticism about the current politics. Um, uh, so um, uh, what I'm trying to say is that then in the book, I've used these images uh, to uh, function as a projection screen, something that uh, um, uh, different people will have uh, super different ideas about. And it's actually petrified in the, in the form of the four texts. Wondering about that if it's uh, really like um, only uh, focusing in the book um, uh, uh, slowly fo focusing on the images, but then makes really sense with uh, mm -hmm. with the text uh, and uh, with another contact. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, are there any questions from the audience? I don't know how how are you with the time. So. Well, oh, okay, then it's something you have discussed. Uh, Hinek, I think we, we still have, what, five minutes? Yes. Still have five minutes. We still have five. Another five minute break. And break sure, we, we have five minutes, and uh, this would be the ideal moment for you to uh, uh, introduce your assignment to the students of uh, photography. Okay, excellent. Uh, so um, I actually thought... Uh, this is something I really need to put in writing then uh, later on. And I, I suppose I will talk to Wojciech uh, on how to communicate with the students. Uh, we need to set up some sort of uh, channel of uh, like um, how to how to perhaps uh, look at things together and how to make sure that everyone's on the same page. Uh, but I had, uh, unsurprisingly, I had um, um, an idea to actually ask the students to uh, think about infrastructures. And uh, um, uh, I mean, this is something that I, uh, I wanna carry on working on and I feel like there's so much uh, space uh, um, for everyone to be uh, funny. Uh, so um, uh, I actually, 
I'm actually in, uh, super much interested in the politics of infrastructures as something that uh, it's like a physical demonstration of ideologies that we are experiencing. Uh, so uh, the assignment would be uh, for the students to choose uh, a piece or element of infrastructure surrounding us. I'm not going to be more specific than that because I, I would actually like to uh, see what could be infrastructure. Mm. Uh, so I would like uh, each one of the students to actually choose a mm, piece of infrastructure, um, um, do a proper research. So this is something we need to talk with Wojciech about how to, how to conduct this. Uh, but uh, I would like to uh, each one of them to actually have a fairly good uh, 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 scope of uh, idea what uh, what the particular infrastructure could be. Uh, um, so I would like them to to actually research the history, the function, the application, or perhaps the connection to everything else. Um, and then I would like uh, to ask the students because I assume that these are going to be mainly students of photography. So I would like to ask the students to uh, do um, a, like a detailed visual documentation. Uh, this is, uh, so detailed visual documentation uh, is probably as precise as I will get. I would like uh, them to feel free to use any, any media. This means photography, video, or even found material. But I would like to, uh, this to be extensive. I would like that they, they actually, um, again with Wojciech, we will talk about uh, whether we need to give it uh, parameters in terms of numbers or size. But I would like that this, uh, uh, this would be an, um, an extensive visual, visual research. Mm. Um, again, we need to talk about how much we can manage. But uh, in this case, I would like to say that more is more. That's it. Is that uh, is that understood? We need to obviously talk about the planning and how we would meet or what would be the sort of uh, my input and students. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Hinek. We will uh, discuss the details. Um, uh, I assure you that now you've got 100% uh, attention of the of the of the students because <laughs> I see the surprise Hello, in their eyes <laughs> and the shock. <laughs> um, thank you so much for today. It was great having you here Absolutely. at the symposium. I hope to have you here um, in uh, in short also uh, in person uh -huh. uh, whenever uh, the situation will allow it and. Um, yeah, st thanks again. Thank you, thank you. Thanks again for the invitation. And I'm looking forward, I um, I suppose we, we have the whole day ahead of us. Is that so? Yes, we do, we do. You, you were uh, indeed the first speaker of the day. I believe mm -hmm. that we will now take a five minutes uh, break and then we will be back with the live stream. Thank you, Hinek, for your Excellent. time today and for your energy and uh, amazing art projects. Thank you. We'll be in touch very soon. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, I'm online. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, do we hear Johannes as well? Um, if, if I say something, you would hear yeah. me. Mm, very good. Goedemorgen, Johannes. Goedemorgen. <laughs> I want Johannes for the for the second time on the on the photography symposium in Pilsen. This time, uh, not physically, but uh, in this form. Still, I hope uh, you will enjoy it, and. Uh, I certainly hope that you will come to us again, visiting us in Pilsen. I would love to. <laughs> okay. Any given moment. You're one of my favorite academies, so uh, whenever I'm there, it's, uh, the, the, the students are promising, strong. The academy is great. <laughs> the teachers are the best. I, mean, I can just say that. <laughs> okay. Now so at the beginning of the session. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I will pass the word now to um, uh, to Jan van Wunzel. We could have done this talk uh, with the three of us in Dutch as well, the Dutch trio, but, um, well, none of us is actually Dutch, but, uh, okay. Which is very good news. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, Jan has uh, a fine introduction to you, so. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the invitation, uh, Wojtek. I'm, I'm always very happy to, uh, to see what you're doing. I like uh, the energy of the symposium. I think it's very brave to just continue even online. So uh, although I would have been loved to be there and meet all the students, of course, and, uh, I'm happy to entertain you together with Jan for the next 60 minutes. Uh, Goedemorgen, Johannes. Uh, heel fijn dat je bij ons bent. Uh... Uh, I will now switch to English uh, to make it a bit more accessible uh, for our online community. Um, our second guest of uh, today is Johannes Schwartz. Johannes lives and works in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and he studied at the Gerrit Rietveld Academy, where he worked in the position of the head of the photography department and is since 2002 a teacher in that studio. Since 2003, he collaborates with the graphic designers of Experimental Jet Set on a series titled High. Johannes held solo exhibitions in Amsterdam, Maastricht, Rome, Brussels and Cologne, and since 1998 participated in group exhibitions in Paris, Berlin, Rotterdam, Jakarta, Venice, Athens, Sofia, Moscow, and now also, of course, in Pilsen. Johannes, I hope you are doing well this morning and I thank you for being part of our symposium. In the exhibition Boundaries, Poetics of Conflict, we displayed six images from your series Capitals. They are split screen prints that place together different moments of different physical landscapes and that due to their, due to their confrontation suggest new narratives. Um, I'm looking forward to be guided through your artistic trajectory trajectory and uh, where do we start? Uh, Jan Reni, thanks for the introduction. I think the, maybe it's good to start with a short notice on the split screens that you see in the exhibition in uh, Pilsen. The, the series of the split screens, if you look at the uh, combinations, I think you doubtlessly can discover that the images are taken, they're everyday pictures, they're pictures from daily life, from anyone could take them. And uh, I think they are a direct consequence of uh, the book Athens Recorder that I made uh, in 2015. Um, so it's daily life, it's uh, uh, banal life, it is about uh, being outside. Uh, and that fact is maybe interesting to know because my practice as an artist started uh, not in the outside world, but very much in the inside world. Uh, uh, and then I took the image of the interior uh, where people live, where people work as a starting point to sort of uh, make a maybe typology of how the human mind works. Uh, and how the human mind works is a quite strange and complex uh, thing, as we all understand. And uh, in the course of time, I found a uh, second, let's say, key to talk about the human mind and how we work, how we look at things. And that uh, is a book uh, 
that are made uh, with a printing technique of the risograph. And uh, the subject of the book is something quite bizarre. If you think about it, it is the animal food uh, that is fed to animals in the zoo. So what do we know about animals and what do we think animals can eat best? What do we serve them to be as original, as healthy, as uh, happy maybe? One never knows where with animals, as they can be in uh, captivity. So there is a strange paradox about uh, projection, knowledge, experience, and uh, intentions that we have to these uh, beasts, to these uh, fellow inhabitants of the planet. Um, there's a little film you can see on the my desktop with a wooden table and a red tea, of a red book with a tea on it, and. Uh, as I just quickly explained, the book is printed in a risograph technique, which is a stencil technique that was originally invented uh, in the, I think, 40s, 50s, uh, for churches and for schools to multiply, to copy texts uh, in a very cheap way, usually one color. And this technique can be, as any technique can be, uh, hacked. This technique can be retune this technique can be interpreted differently and interpreting differently in this way means that it is not used for text but used for images and if you want to print images then position then fidelity uh, authenticity uh, uh, all these terms do play an important term if we spread if we multiply the amount of a singular image to a multitude. And I think photography is a beautiful medium because one of the things that it's really based on is a multitude of images and not uh, so that one image exists in uh, a manifold uh, number of copies. Now, has the, the risograph, the practical problem that it is so incredibly unprecise because it is not made for image production that you, how could I say, you only produce mistakes. Right. Uh, this is like uh, playing the wrong notes on the piano, but doing it so perfectly that everybody loves it. Right. That's the idea of the whole thing. Um, so what I did, I was invited at the Jan van Eyck Academy, a very nice uh, master uh, uh, academy at uh, Maastricht. Uh, they invited me for three months to uh, spend time there and. Uh, uh, dedicate my knowledge that I had built up as an artist and bring this into the workspaces and I choose, choose the print shop and the print shop had the risograph so I uh, developed within three months a new palette of printing uh, for color and for black and white and this led to a complete new interpretation of the images and uh, I'm almost there with the point that I want to make this new interpretation of this new color styles this new color uh, maybe even theories, if you like, uh, allowed me to interpret the animal food into something else than just cookbook uh, photographs, but to transport, uh, let's say, the ambiguity of uh, what it means to keep animals, to uh, let them illustrate themselves in a cultured uh, environment uh, to the best. Whew. So. Now, uh, the consequence of this is very simple. All books are different. Uh, the motives are the same, but the images in the book all do look slightly different. Uh, now, I let you enjoy the film. Um, here we go. And what you're seeing is the zoo of Moscow. And why is it the zoo of Moscow? Simply because uh, the zoo of Moscow uh, allowed me to photograph in the kitchens. Animal food is a very uh, taboo, very uh, secret uh, subject. No zoo ever allows you to photograph it. What you see now is the cages. So there's a mix of the cages and the food.
maybe it is nice to uh, tell the little anecdote that uh, every page is uh, printing wise improvised at the very moment the page was printed mm -hmm. so the designers uh, made the book in black and white and standing at the press and the press is like a photocopy machine standing at the press we decided which colors to give the page uh, look the production of the book took two years there were 16,000 pages fold by hand so it is very intense and very uh, labor uh, uh, yeah intensive is the best word um, so it's, it is produced 250 pieces and uh, of the 250 pieces I think they were sold out in, uh, in, in one week or two weeks so that was the very strange moment to it was almost uh, how to say that it was always like a boutique thing to do which was very much against my belief of uh, the photograph and as a reaction to that here we go I decided to make something that is entirely machine produced in a large quantity uh, that is a book about Athens Athens in the year 2015 in the summer and uh, yeah you can see it uh 2015 the summer and the september and november in uh, athens i think i uh, hope you remember all the refugees came and athens uh if you know athens athens is a very big wild and uh really the city city there's nothing picturesque about it it's just a wild mix of uh, uh traces of history of a city that is uh, really li living from its uh very necessary maintenance. There's uh, eight million people, right? Uh, there's a mix of inhabitants, of people in the street, of tourists. So I wanted to investigate the idea of what outside life on the street looks like. Can I make a difference between uh, tourists, inhabitants? Is there at the different uses can it can i sense as an outsider the difference between a refugee and someone who lives there so i went there for two times one week and photographed uh, originally everything maybe that's a nice thing to tell the students i made i made a plan and the plan was to photograph the leftovers of the olympics of 2004. Um, but I quite quickly found out that the leftovers of the Olympics of 2004 were just all stadiums. Look, all stadiums are always romantic, but on the other hand, they just are all stadiums. So it doesn't really say much about the place. So what it turned out to be is that I photographed on the way to the old stadiums. I photographed everything on the street that I saw, mainly people interacting, being together. Um, and Wojtek knows, Jan doesn't, uh, this is the first time in my life that I ever dared to photograph people uh, directly. So I would photograph portrait people indirectly by photographing their places, but I would never really aim the lens or the camera to someone and uh, make the people part of my uh, view on the world. Uh, now, as you can see, there's uh, many different subjects of the thing. Now we are at the museum part. And the book is a, a big book. It's a 540 pages. It's 17 chapters. And the chapters are imaginary days. Uh, it's all fictive. It's all it's not true. But uh, the juxtaposition of the images may be a little bit like the like the split screens suggests many, many things. And I think the more you know, uh, the easier, the different you read it. Now, this is, for example, day three, number four. And uh, if you look at the double pages, the double pages are very much uh, 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 design-wise. Uh, my daughter's getting the keys. So I have to look at that. Uh, design was it is uh, the design is borrowed from a newspaper. The black blocks uh, maybe resemble missing text. Uh, 
and uh, the layout is small, many small images relating to each other on the double page. And maybe it is nice for you to know, uh, you're all photographers, so you want to know, how did he do this? I did something very stubborn. I got myself a sports, sports photograph lens, right? So the, this one of these zoom, zoom monsters that allows you to see things in 200 meters away, right? And not just for fun, it's the opposite. It really is the opposite of any telephone photograph simply because things are not here but there they're far away okay and not just for fun the next time you step if you have the smoking break in uh, let's say 30 minutes instead of uh, looking what's in front of you you look at all the things that are far away and you will be carried away by the sheer amount of things that you could photograph them so it allowed me to it was sort of how to say, much more puzzling, much more um, it was more much more filmic than I usually would work. You see the picture there's a very long lens with a guy that stands, let's say 200 meters away, and then of course you understand people still sense it that they are photographed. That's the nice thing, but it's the opposite of the wide angle, the documentary, the honest. So let's say it's maybe all a lie, right? It is all set up, right? So this mix of the, the setup, the organized, the, the staged, if you like, together with this uh, more journalistic setup of the image as itself so there's there's a lot of people looking at their own photographs looking at their own uh, screens together then with these radical cuts of the statues for example and that maybe it's good but if you, if you see the book it's maybe good to know there's one principle that i always follow with the designers that i very often work together with their very close friends of mine, the experimental yet sets. Jan mentioned them in the very beginning of the introduction for the high series. There's one thing that we have, and I really strongly recommend this to all of you. Uh, we talk about what the book uh, should be about, and then I give them all the images, and they can do with the images whatever they want. So let's just flip back a few images. These images here that you see here, right? the chapter with the C. Uh, they're just normal photographs and then the designers uh, put the, the print screen dot in it, they put them on top of each other, they made them bitmaps and uh, zoomed in, bleached them out. Um, so that is one of the things that we allow each other. Uh, it demands a lot from them but in return you get uh, or I got something that really very well works as a book, right? So in this case, with the Athens recorder, the work only exists in the book. There's no, it is, it's not shown on the wall, right? It's not uh, print, it's not framed. Um, so it's a, I'm not sure whether democratic is the good word. I mean, the, the book is still very expensive. It's still very specific, but at least, I mean, it's accessible for everyone, right? Um, maybe I, I'm not sure how many, how much more time we have, but maybe it's nice to look at two other projects. One that I personally very, very, very much like is the other, let me ask to, uh, to what again to Jan, and then they can, uh, investigate with the audience present in Pilsen. Do you want to see the Montreal project or do you want to see what did the Schwarz do earlier? Yeah. What other votes? Let's see all of it. Uh... All of it, okay, no problem. Let's go for all of it. Uh, then I tried to rush a bit uh, quicker through the through the Mondian. The Mondian is uh, is uh, the Mondian project is the outcome of uh, of uh, something. I'm always a bit shy to say it, but uh, um, hey, let's let's have no secrets today. Um, look, I'm an artist, but I'm a photographer as well, so I'm really working applied. 
And uh, applied work uh, uh, can be very nice, but it can be very confusing as well because you have to do things where you think, oh, do I really have to do that? So I got a commission to uh, um, copy photographs of someone else in a different context, which made me quite angry. And I said, I can't do that. There's too much pride in me. So please allow me to find a different approach to the thing. I had to photograph archives of museum. And, uh, and I said, uh, yeah, complicated, complicated. We really want to stick to... Um, to the idea that you just copy someone else's work. And uh, I found a way out, but on this really tragic, horrible assignment, I stumbled upon this photo album. And this photo album uh, is kept uh, uh, at uh, an archive and it contains photographs that Mondrian took in the 30s in uh, Paris of his new paintings. And he took them like a little sample book with him to show to other artists, to museum directors, what uh, his latest work looked like. Look, uh, and then you think, yeah, God, everybody did it. But look, at that time, that was quite unlikely that people made a sort of a portfolio, if you like. Okay, and what happens if you open the book, then, uh, then this happened, now does it play? Yeah, look. You open the book, oops, that was too quick. You open the book and then you get uh, an old-fashioned photo album paper, right? And a black and white photograph laying on the side because what you have to do, and you see it in this album, it's the same, the same idea. What you see here is that the, album, the photograph has to be turned 90 degree to see the painting in the right orientation but hey we are still looking at the black and white image so what did the Mondrian do it's all very old right he wrote on the back of the image a little note and this one says it's the first uh, uh, canvas after arriving in London uh, in 38 and then it comes this is what took really grabbed my attention it says what you're seeing in the front it says the small colored square is red, right? Just to uh, jump back. And it's probably not that one, but another one, but it describes what you're seeing on the front, right? So what, just, just for you, you open the page, then you see an image on the side. You have to flip it to 90 degrees, usually counterclockwise if you like. Then you see the image, but you still don't see it. So you have to flip the whole image and then you see what you're, then you understand what you're seeing. And then all these photographs have these little notes. Here, if you look very carefully, it says in the middle, Bleu, and Mondrian had the funny uh, habit to speak the language of the country where he was at. So these photographs are taken in Paris, so he speaks French and calls it Bleu. And now we come, uh, we jump back from the object that the whole exhibition was about to the guy Mondrian himself, and we see him here. Uh, 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 in the beginning of the 20th century, he still is in Laren then in the Netherlands, and uh, um, probably you're not familiar with the figure of Mondrian, and uh, how he looked, but at that time he was uh, a completely different figure uh, in what he wanted and what he did, and it's not working, and why is that? Oh, here, so... We have to, to pause a little bit and look at him sitting in his own atelier and reading a book. And uh, the image as such maybe is nothing different from all other images that are taken of artists at the time. Wasn't it the case that Monion was a quite quick adapter in uh, making progress in what he believed in and how he took this belief as part of his self-representation as part of his work? Poor complicated. Now look, um, there's two, two remarkable things in the photograph. If you look carefully, Mondrian is reading a book, right? And he's not looking into the camera. And the other thing is that uh, right up from Mondrian, there is a death mask. And if you look very careful, and if you saw the death mask once before, you might understand this is Mr. Beethoven himself in the atelier of Mondrian. And that suggests, if you want, that Mondrian listened to classical music. Very soon after 
Mondia moved to Paris. And in Paris, something else started, namely the interest for new music. And now we just, just for the fun, look at this image. This is later on in, uh, in his atelier in, uh, in Paris. And what happens here? There is no book. Mondrian uh, is strictly for, but it was strictly forbidden to photograph Mondrian in his atelier with anything written or anything printed. So the any, only thing that was allowed to be shown was uh, uh, the atelier, where part of the paintings were part of the decoration of the atelier. And him, with no beard, a modern, uh, modern suit, uh, short hair, uh, glasses, and a, and a uh, record player as, as the image of the modern man, right? And the light left down, we see another a painting of this. So this contrast of uh, Mondrian, that uh, this is one thing, one view of the atelier again. And here we see him. So the whole exhibition was a play of the of uh, the guy representing himself uh, uh, within his work, within his atelier. And the atelier for me was important as it is, uh, let's say, this, the sum of, uh, this was the overview of an exhibition, by the way, uh, the sum of the artist. So I used uh, his address book that you can see here, a very neatly book that was not typewritten, but uh, handwritten. So this, this strange sort of, Mm, an unlogical, modern, old-fashioned behavior of being, you know, hanging out with the avant-garde, hanging out with the, with the news development, but writing by hand, not using a typewriter, okay? Um, Mario was concerning this, uh, a very interesting figure to me, and I like the idea of photography, in uh, uh, in his work, Mondrian himself hated photography. I thought uh, it's just beginning. It is a very it is a very uh, um, new and very uh, childish medium. But there is hope. He says at a certain moment there is hope for photography to develop and maybe reach the same intensity and the same let's say uh, uh, importance as painting right uh, so if you worry was he a positive figure not really uh, this is another overview of the show so i used the other thing that i used were the records that mondrian uh, played in his studio and at a certain moment he gave the records away and then that's maybe a little funny anecdote that the given away record, records that he gave to a friend and that he didn't listen to himself anymore, were kept as Mondrian's former records in the museum in The Hague. Uh, so if you worry about, about uh, fetish, if you worry about, uh, let's say, the object, and uh, uh, yeah, I'm sure you, I think you, you, get, you get the idea that he, he played them once and because of this once being played by Mondrian, the significance of the ob object was uh, undoubtful. That, that I found all very interesting. So it's a mix of, uh, let's say, all the ingredients of Mondrian's life that he sooner or later used while making art. And there's one other thing that I want to to show to you. Look, this, for example, is interesting. There are two, twice the same print, press prints, and there's a slight difference in them. Uh, but they were still kept as two different press prints in the archive, that is done with the digital. This is unimaginable. You would not keep two versions of a JPEG, right? Maybe you would. Um, now there comes one important thing, and this is maybe the uh, the clue to the whole story. It's the image that you see in the back. It's this image, and then if you look very careful, there are two things are happening. Uh, on the left hand side, you see an image where there's a contradiction of the but the quality of the image at the center is and that there is to the sides. Maybe I can use the mouse. Can you see why, what I do with the mouse? So this is the center and here, there is something is happening here, which I show you in the next image. And the other image to the right hand side is, is uh, interesting because Mondrian at a certain moment decided to change its orientation. Um, and probably you don't remember, but I showed you an image with this very painting, uh, of the atelier, and in this atelier image, the image is upside down. So what happened, Mondrian hanged the image in the atelier and decided at a certain moment, this image needs to be upside down. So he took it off the wall, cleaned it, 
and then hang it upside down. So this is uh, uh, an interesting outcome of the whole project because the archive that I borrowed the album from only understood that he changed the orientation after I took that photograph. And then the other thing that is interesting is the left-hand photograph because it says a lot about, let's say, the, the use of photography and Mondian's approach to it. I look carefully in the, on the left-hand side here. The image is perfectly perfectly in focus and very detailed, really, really extremely beautiful. And then on the right-hand side, if you look carefully here, the print loses detail and it loses sharpness. And instead of saying, okay, uh, I take a new photograph, what did Mondrian do? He took the brush and retouched the original painting in the photographic print, right? And this for Mr. Perfection, who was really, really very, very, very much into the ultimate image. So the ultimate image maker uses the photograph to tell about his paintings, uses the brush to elevate the photograph to come closer to the painting. This, all this together made me so intensely happy that I thought this deserves a show. Okay, if, if you're still up to it, I could continue and show you what I did, how it all came so far. Are you still up for it or are you, well, is it too much? You're fine? Okay, yeah, okay. If you're still fine, then this sounds like an uh, invitation to continue. <laughs> ah. uh, what I can show you is... Uh, what I can show you is the, why is it not working the way I want to? Uh, yeah, that's what I want. Um, so this is a mix of the projects I did in the last uh, years, 20 years. And it starts with the very work that I made when I graduated. And that was a series of children's huts in the playgrounds in Amsterdam. And there was something very nice about it because the kids were totally free to improvise with a saw and the hammer and nails and pieces of wood to build whatever they wanted. And nicely enough, all the kids decided to build houses, right? And these houses uh, I found very uh, striking because there were certain elements of uh, architecture uh, that we seem to know, like these little roofs, for example. And there are other just practical uh, uh, solutions that uh, I very much like to uh, document as houses, though I use the logic of Bernd and Hiller Becher to photograph in black and white under a certain angle to elevate these little uh, uh, kids' fantasies into actual, yeah, how to say, buildings. And by that, really let the, the children and their idea about space and environment come in the first place. So there's the outside of the, hits, the huts and then there's the inside of the huts. And the inside of the huts is even nicer because it uh, introduces for the first time something that I very strongly am interested in, and that's the idea of trash or leftovers. And so the insides of the huts are made from trash from the street of Amsterdam. Uh, there are lamps and there are electronic devices because the kids are allowed to have uh, electricity in that. So anything that is of, uh, can be used with electricity becomes uh, value. And if you look at the the left hand side, what do you see? Romantic, analog, it's a slide, slide uh, looking, it's a sort of a light box for looking at slides. And then it's funny enough, it's put upside down, which is funny, but it functions as a lamp, right? So this photographic device to look at slides on the left hand side, on the right hand side, just this very ugly, clunky, chunky uh, uh, office lightings, all found from the street and then all rearranged with this black, nasty leather sofa into a hangout. So this world or this system or this appreciation of uh, reused trash in the hangout was a, a, a really a shocking eye-opener to me. And uh, that led me to the interest in the interior to, to show people that live in places, in spaces, and uh, to to talk about their inner worlds. And uh, uh, one of these other inner worlds that I was really 
curious about was the world of how do blind people think about uh, their own space that they live in. And uh, so I photographed, uh, I think, seven interiors of blind people. And they had a very beautiful of, uh, way of talking about the interior, namely about uh, remembrance. So everything was uh, that uh, they had to think back. And if they look for something, they uh, think back, what, what did I do? So where did I put the pages? Where did, put, where did I put the magazine? And they all were very, very strongly informed what was visible. Uh, another series about the, the inside world and the, um, let's say, pragmatic use of uh, what man can build is the uh, hunting huts. The hunting huts are uh, these strange little uh, things that uh, hunters can build in the woods. There's no rules for that, right? There's maybe uh, the idea of knowing nature and knowing. Uh, what works best, but for the rest, it's it's all up to the fantasy of the hunter, and uh, this counts for the outside, but it does count as well for the inside. And the inside of these hunting huts, you already guess. Another episode in leftovers and trash are um, decorated completely to the to the yeah, let's say effort or pleasure of the hunter. So you see old. Uh, carpet pieces you see custom made things that this funny cushion there down is for the rifle um, there's a mix of coziness uh, and um, pragmatism in it so there are two two parts of this series one is the let's say focuses very much on the material side there's a, these are these ones in color and then there's another one in black and white and the, the black and white one focuses really on the reuse of chairs, the office chairs, school chairs. And at that time, you have to understand what I did was really, it was really, uh, I was very, let's say, unspontaneous. I thought of something, not, not on the location, but somewhere else. And I thought, this seems a good idea. So I made a plan. I went there, I photographed it. And uh, anything else that I encountered on the way there uh, didn't, didn't matter. Quite the opposite of what I did at the Athens recorder. This is another series of interiors, and that is uh, um, uh, photo models in Paris that are that just arrived there, and they're renting quite exorbitant, expensive uh, rooms. And those are quite improvised, quite sad. model rooms then there comes a series of reproductions from a former furnishing catalog from East Germany and then there comes the jump to what maybe ultimately ended in the Mondrian that I just showed you and that was an exhibition about Van Gogh and Gauguin at the Van Gogh Museum and it showed for the first time <clears throat> since many many years uh, three versions of La Berceuse which you just saw here and uh, three versions of the sunflowers. And uh, I'm not sure whether who of you have ever seen an original version of the sunflowers, so not on a napkin and not on a coffee cup and not on a puzzle or not on your grandmother's plastic bag. But if you see them in real, they're quite uh, impressive simply because you think you know them, right? It's this little bit this strange New York feeling. If you think, ah, I've seen it so often, uh, I think I know them. But look on top of it that you that you have this feeling of commonness. You're quite flabbergasted if you see all or three of the four versions next to each other, right? So there's not one hanging, but three. And then something happens in your mind that is quite uh, spooky uh, because you're so overwhelmed, at least maybe you're not, I was, that my gaze dropped down to find something that I can trust. I mean, this, this was too much. It was hyper real. So I... My mind sort of uh, flipped to the shadows of the frames on the wall. And then I thought, you know, I, the only thing I could really grasp or understand are these sort of scattered shadows of the frames, this perfect museum lighting that creates this sort of movement in the frame shadow. And that I want to photograph. And then wonder above wonder, uh, the director of the museum said, it's strictly forbidden to photograph the sunflowers professionally, but the idea is so absolutely mad and crazy that you don't want to photograph the, the work, but the shadow of the frame, I allow you to. 
And then the good news for you is, of course, I felt the first time there was a mistake in the camera. There was a little hole in the bellows and uh, I had to redo it. And on the last day of the exhibition, I managed to do that. Um, these are fire steeples in the east of the Netherlands. So it's the landscape together with the private gardens that sort of made up the huge piles of ritual fires. So you see the something that's gone by fire, in, immaterial sort of uh, landscape ideas. Uh, that is a little funny assignment I did two years ago, or last, last summer 2019 for Fantastic Man, the, the magazine, just to really give you a proof that I, I love really working applied. Uh, so it's always a great fantasy. I photographed the uninhabited islands in the Greek Sea. Strange thing to do, but... Uh, so please, if you can, if you can go for a practice that combines applied work and uh, art, always do that. Uh, this is the place where the Night Watch once was hanging, and they led to a series of wall paintings and photographs. Um, this is the unused art of the Ministry of Social Affairs. And here you see the mix of the photographs of the unused, not shown paintings of the Ministry of Social Affairs, the wall painting of the Night Watch, and on the left hand side, the uh, Van Gogh's. So this would be a presentation way of my works. Installational, if you like. Mm, that's a portrait of uh, an old lady that lived for 60, house, for 60 years in the same house. Uh, that looked like this. So I decided to photograph the plastic bags only that were present in the house. It was at the Cobra Museum, so you see next to the Karl Appel painting that could not be moved, so I had to relate to it. Mm. And this is one of the collaborations that I very much like with an architect. So I think the, the main essence for me is uh, that this is twofold. One is uh, please go for the applied work and find your own uh, special uh, findings within the applied work to make uh, to to develop. And the other thing is find co collaborators uh, from different fields. So not find architects, find graphic designers, find writers, find uh, designers to share your vocabulary to share your uh, view on the world, to uh, develop your own options of using photography. That's the biennial in the Dutch Pavilion in 2011. You see the wall painting of the Rembrandt in the back again. And then you see one of the highs that uh, Jan so kindly talked about. He made a high of the or the presence the Ministry of Social Affairs got uh, from other nations as a representation of national pride. And then here, the image, the big orange thing, is the backside of our parliament, which is built as a Greek theater. So I used the, the back wall of the parliament as the stage wall of the pavilion. Close up. Uh, that's the tear garden that you already saw and hopefully liked. If there is a risograph at uh, your academy, I can only recommend you to buy a lot of cake, coffee and chocolate for the guy that is in charge of it and then learn to master it. But you need the person that operates it to help you. Uh, Mondrian again, and I think, I think, yeah, that's, that's very much it in a way. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's it, ladies and gentlemen. The, now it's uh, coffee or beer. No. Um, this is what I wanted to show you. Maybe uh, can I answer questions or uh, of yes. any kind? Thank you, uh, Johannes. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, um, are there questions from our students here in our live audience for Johannes? Um, we still have a little bit of time. I have a, a question or maybe connected to some, some kind of an uh, observation. And uh, then we still have a bit of time for you 
to introduce your uh, assignment uh, to the to the mm -hmm. students of uh, photography. Um, one thing that I that I noticed and it it sort of intrigues me, um, uh, you know, when you when you showed your uh, project, the Athens recorder, um, in maybe the first pages that you showed to us uh, online, the, there were a couple of images uh, that were sort of uh, fading to white, like mm -hmm. the images is disappearing. Mm -hmm. The image is actually disappearing, and then it sort of um, continues by uh, by sort of the choice to insert these black boxes. Uh, yeah. And and you mentioned uh, it's sort of like a moment of uh, a missing text, but this is this is I think highly fascinating, because I, I uh, first of all I was thinking like okay it could be a decision made by the experimental jet set designers, but actually it came back in your presentation. In the images that you showed, of course, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Mondrian in Paris, we see black re rectangles on his uh, uh, atelier wall. And uh, even more so in your uh, photos of the Van Gogh uh, paintings in which you basically say that the shadows of the frames uh, of the paintings were actually uh, mm. uh, to, to you sort of more intriguing than the actual uh, uh, painting. And then, we're talking about sort of like the absence of an image as the image, uh, the periphery mm -hmm. of an artwork. Uh, can you say something more about this idea? Uh -huh. um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm always very impressed if I hear uh, so wise words connecting. Look, you have to understand that this, the, the, the pure time span of, you know, what we just looked at is something like 20 years. Um, so I can, I'm very happy to hear uh, this, that you see a connection of uh, the elements. Um, uh, and, and I am because um, one can't plan that, right? Uh, the, that is the disadvantage of the, let's say, of photography on the one hand, because photography always needs something else to be able to talk about something, right? So I can't, I could never establish directly uh, the, yeah we could never establish directly uh, let's say a route to to make all these imageries and uh, and create their dependencies because I understand what I like about your comment is that you see that images are dependent from each other right that you and, the, and in both directions, right? The new images are depending on the old images and the old images are always depending on the new images. So it's a, that, that is a very dynamic exchange of two, uh, yeah, it's not worlds, but of two uh, uh, moments in time maybe. And it sounds a bit uh, spacey, but I think as a photographer, you're really, that is one of the great things that you, that you are uh, creating image spaces and they're mainly rooted in time. They're dependent in time and, uh, and uh, they're dependent in context. And uh, uh, but this, this let's say this this periphery, this uh, let's say and, and periphery maybe is the same as context. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But one we could just try to, uh, to to just claim that it is for the moment. Uh, that this this together with the ruin on the one hand, so the 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 meant to be decay on the one hand of the image, which is the degrading and lightness, which is the, uh, the variation in the moment, uh, which you see in the Athens recorder at the very, at the very uh, beginning of the book. Look, if you see a photographer that is fading away for a, for a book about a place that is so extremely densely photographed, uh, I, I, I would never think about it, but, but look, at the moment I photographed the guy photographing and looking at this image that of course let's say i let a base for um, exploring or for creating that image so that's a very complicated answer that i'm giving i'm trying to say the following yes uh, i am depending on dependent on the graphic designers absolutely and yes they are fully dependent on what i give to them so uh, um, um, the educated guess that photography usually is, you know, can become meaningful by a writer, by a, let's say, very aware contextualization, by a very aware uh, manifestation of the periphery. Um, um, yeah, is that a good answer to your question? Yes, it is. Um, thank you, uh, Johannes. Um, are there questions from our uh, yeah. dear public? 
uh, Wojciech would like to ask you a question, if that's okay for you. Of course. Oh, really? <laughs> Uh, Johannes, I was I was wondering uh, because um, there are uh, it was great to see your uh, work uh, like um, in time, uh, and and there definitely are kind of uh, uh, connections and 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 and, and development, and uh, but I was wondering you uh, you you never work with your archive because a lot of our students. Uh, like um, frequently grab back to their archive or uh, intensively work with their archive and you are more kind of guy who uh, um, goes to new and new uh, projects and, and, and is that true? Look, Wojtek, it's, it is very funny. Of course, the, maybe Jan does know, the audience can't know. Uh, many, 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 no, well, 20, 22 years. Wojtek and me together were like you that are sitting in the audience, right? Young, uh, full of energy. And, uh, uh, and it's funny that you're asking me this question because uh, now what I present to you is exactly, uh, it gives you the impression that I'm the guy that always goes to the new, but the guy that sits here in the yellow pullover has the same notion as the audience that sits there in the room. I created a horrible, really painstakingly big, you would be so kind, Wojtek, to call it archive, and I would say a jungle of imagery that I save for and then look, the word later would like to be used, but no. So it waits for a moment of editing, of use, and uh, no. So I am like you are uh, maniacally collecting images uh, sometimes in specific contexts, sometimes just for the for the big bunch, if you like, and they wait for they wait for this newly created periphery that Jan is talking about. Um, so the the Athens recorder, for example, as a form, uh, very much helped me to at least. Uh, concentrate content-wise on how this archive or how this, you know, the archive as such is, it's, it's, it's meaningless if you don't use it, right? Uh, on the other hand, what I very often discover that the archive is something that can be unused, right? It's not, it's not a burden. It's not an obligation. Uh, and it certainly is no solution for uh, being modern. So on the one hand, I would say, of course, it's nice to have an archive. On the other hand, I very much regret that I started working like this uh, because it um, demands uh, time. Right? You really need time to work with an archive and you really need a partner in that. Uh, so um, I would say um, the shitty answer that I'm giving you, sorry to encourage, dis disencourage you, but don't really think about new things. You're too young to use your own archive. Oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, all sympathy goes away. But uh, I would always say, what the nice thing is, being at an academy is that you have great teachers and that the great teachers uh, together with you sense what matters for you. Uh, and let's say this, this notion is something to me that you look uh, into the future much more than looking into the past. And then if you're all the gray, you can look back and use your archive. But while you're young and promising, uh, make new works. Sorry. So, but I know, I know there's nothing is nicer, right? Nothing is nicer that, that, that you have the moment and that you have the concentration and that you look into what you did and then think, wow, now I see a line, now I see an aspect and see a new form with dealing with my own imagery. I fully sympathize with that idea. I have to admit, it's a very important learning moment in the study. So, of course, you have to use the archive, but don't make it into, you know, don't make it into a something significant that you are depending on. You know, I think it's nice to really to photography is something that wants to be out, right? It needs, you know, it's it's like, yeah, it, it uh, yeah, it's 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 it's. It's, a weapon is the wrong word, but you know, but it's so strong. So don't, if, if it can be strong, share it and show it. And, uh, and don't put it first in an archive and use it later. 
too idealistic maybe, but uh, think about Hannah, it once in a while. <laughs> Hannes, we still have um, a couple of uh, minutes, I guess, to uh, listen. Yes, Simon. Listen to your um, um, uh, to the introduction of your assignment that uh, that you want to uh, give to the students of photography. I think the students of photography that uh, unfortunately uh, have no clue uh, what they. I think you all are busy with different um, ways of discovering what the medium means to you. So some of you must work with found footage, other work with archives, other work creates everything new, then some of you might mix it. Uh, maybe there's a lot of experiment involved. So um, but what is important to me is that you just that you stick to the way you work. Right, so if you look at what work a lot with an archive, you continue doing that. But there's one thing that I would like you to do, and that is um, to show how much, how, how long the, the assignment will be. But two months, or what is there a time time frame for it? Project? Do we have three months, or half a year, or four years, or? Let's keep it with two months. Two months, okay, but then that's that, 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 that the only thing that matters to me is uh, is that you create something every week uh, and something very simple, very close to you, and then I would I would be very curious to mainly because I want to learn what um, interests you in the medium. I would invite you to make a split screen so combine two images into one every week, right? Um, and then you can combine your own work, you can combine your work and someone else's work, and you can combine someone else's work and someone else's work, but that you stick to this formal idea of the split screen. And uh, I would, before you start doing that, I would, I would like to invite you to do a little Google, uh, maybe teacher discussion, maybe there's I know there are professionals in your academy that can introduce you into that to the to the logic of the split screen in film, right? So when is the split screen used to in film to uh, to uh, yeah maybe to allow a different view on the plot on the narrative, right? So what what does the split screen mean for let's say storytelling? What does the split screen visually do uh, to the viewer? So you have to do a little research, a little uh, digging into history. Uh, and maybe you just look at films differently if you know that the split screen is involved as a method. So create one split screen every week. And then if I'm not mistaken, if you have two months, then we have uh, uh, eight split screens and uh, uh, that we can talk about. If you are very enthusiastic and uh, things seem to work out easily, make more than one, right? Um, and the good news is, I repeat one more time, you can make new things, you can use your archive. Look, all the, all the uh, images are, that are shown in, capital, the, in the exhibition that Jan curated, that, that is all my archive, telephone archive, right? So, uh, I use, of course, I use, I use my archive, but uh, you're free in that, right? Is that, does that sound clear or? Uh, everybody is... Uh, Nodding. Uh, 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 Nodding. Exactly, exactly. Uh, anyway, we will, we will probably get it from you in, uh, in writing too, so that we can uh, communicate it uh, no. uh, once again with uh, no. <laughs> the students. Um, <laughs> Um, thank you so much, Johannes, for your uh, presentation, for your for your uh, time My with pleasure. us uh, here in uh, in Pilsen. Um, the exhibition is uh, closing uh, today. Actually, it's the last day that we uh, have our exhibition in the gallery. Uh, as you know, we have the digital um, uh, exhibition online. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and we are looking forward to meeting you uh, sometime next year. Yeah. Me too. Thanks for listening. It was a pleasure to uh, to have such an extensive, long period of time to uh, to. It's always interesting to see your your own work, 
back so uh, so uh, compact. I hope it made sense for you. If you want to know anything and you don't dare to speak up now, you can always send me an email. Uh, please don't be shy. And uh, I'm very happy to help you with anything that I can. Um, uh, it's on the website. Uh, Jan has it. Uh, Wojtek has it. So if there's anything I can do for you, I'm very happy. And, uh, and we meet either in person or the next time uh, uh, online to look at the split screens together. Thanks. Take care. Thank you, Johannes.
the zoom? Uh, photos Is it Rui? Yeah. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, back at the second part of our uh, of our symposium today. Uh, welcome back, our live audience here at the Sutner Faculty. Believe it or not, 
Uh, we have about uh, 20 people here, which is actually the limit which we uh, may call together um, as it uh, concerns the, uh, the regulations which are now in place. Um, welcome everybody who is online and, and uh, welcome uh, Roy Greenberg. I've, we really uh, were speculating about how to pronounce your name because uh, we have uh, like Dutch background and and Rui sounded so 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 very Dutch. But uh, <laughs> um, happy happy to be Dutch. <laughs> and of course, we have misinterpreted the, the the painting behind you as Dutch landscape. So I won't go further on that. <laughs> and I will give uh, uh, Jan van Woenso now the word with the introduction of your work. Thank you. Thank you, Wojtek. Um, <clears throat> so yes, uh, I was actually wrong with uh, in, uh, you know recognizing the painting in uh, in your uh, background, um, and I'm sort of guessing that it will uh, will relate to your presentation of today, uh, being uh, in English landscape painting. Uh, so, audience, uh, welcome back. The third speaker of today is uh, Rui Greenberg. Uh, Rui is based in London, where too he relocated from Tel Aviv in 2018. He completed his bachelor at Minshar College in Israel and his master degree in photography at the Royal College of Art in London. His work was represented in exhibitions in London, New York, Santa Fe, Marrakesh, Braga, Lotz, and Athens. For the exhibition here in Pilsen, we selected a number of photographs from the series Along the Break, which follows Israel's longest single road along the Great Rift Valley from north to south and from border to border. This project depicts fortified borders, landfills, minefields, traces of the past, uh, abandoned places of once envisioned uh, unity, watchtowers and ruins. Perhaps one of the most striking photos in the project of Along the Break is the work titled Stone Carved Trail from 2013. Uh, it shows a man-made forest planted where there used to be an Arab village. This village was demolished after the 1948 war which mapped out the borderlines of the state of Israel and erased this village comple completely and replaced it by the man-made forest. Rui, uh, thank you for being part of this project, uh, exhibition and the symposium. And uh, I guess we are ready to travel with you along the break. If you want, you can start your presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jan and Wojtek, for uh, inviting me. And uh, I don't know if uh, Doron Pollack is also watching, but uh, I would like to uh, thank him very much for introducing us, a uh, dear friend from Israel. So I will take you, as you suggested, through a couple of my projects that uh, we'll see how the time goes, but I'll start with uh, along the way. Can you see my, uh, my shared screen? Yes. Yeah, so as you nicely described it, Along the Break is a project following the Israeli frontier. Israel is quite a small country and I was making landscape pictures uh, in Israel for quite a while. Uh, maybe not as experienced as some of the other speakers, um, but I was working on making work in Israel from roughly 2011 and this project came along later on as I accumulated more work, but also conceptually were able to kind of uh, compose it into a body of work that was uh, hopefully uh, became a little bit bigger than the individual image, images. So just gonna flick through a couple of images. And as you described it, Jan, the Great Rift Valley which is where I'm taking the name, the break, the Hebrew name for the Great Rift Valley is the break or the Great Break. Um, so I, I was working along those uh, uh, topographical, geographical elements of the Great Rift Valley, which on the map here you can see 
on the right you can see the topographic map of Israel and where you see the the water basically the Sea of Galilee in the north going down along the Jordan River to the Dead Sea and down south down south to the, the Red Sea and all of those uh, geographical elements are also setting the Israeli borders so in the north it creates uh, the physical border with Lebanon and Syria, uh, with Jordan on the eastern front, uh, crossing through the West Bank, which is also a very uh, tainted uh, and problematic political uh, place or geography, and down all the way to Eilat, which is the border with Egypt. So I was using this physical feature to kind of map my way and going back and forth for five years or so, even more accumulating work on a road, the Route 90, which is, as you said, the, the longest single road in Israel. But if you see, it's 470 kilometers. It's not that long. So to drive it in one go will probably take you about six hours, five, six hours. So working along this one kind of single road and, and extensions of it along the borders for such a long time and being an Israeli born and, and growing up there, serving in the army, I had a, a very kind of intimate knowledge of this uh, territory. Um, what I was looking at when I was uh, starting to, to make work, to make pictures of landscape, I was really kind of drawn to the American, uh, the American notion of the road trip, these endless vast open spaces and contemplation of like a place that is uh, depicted but it's also a mental space that the photographer or the artist is portraying this is alex off uh, very recommended uh, project sleeping by the mississippi uh, which is kind of more contemporary uh, american large format camera very photographic but also very kind of metaphoric uh, allegorical story or narrative uh, a little bit earlier is Joel Sternfeld, uh, also like I think he won a Guggenheim scholarship and used it to for a, over a year to travel across the US and this idea of like going for such a long duration and keep going to new places was something that I was really drawn to. Stephen Shore as well, just kind of giving you a little bit of background to my uh, uh, my early uh, stage of research or uh, uh, inspiration. Um, so yeah, I was uh, really interested in taking this massive epic road trip, but going back to the physicality of Israel, this was, uh, this was uh, the more I was going on the same repet repetitive kind of journey on the same road, it became more of an irony or something to highlight how claustrophobic or small Israel is. But a lot of the work are uh, referring to this American kind of notion of road trip photography rather than uh, maybe Israeli uh, uh, history of art or photography of how Israeli artists portray this place. Because in Israel at the time when I was studying for my BA, I was Keep getting, I kept getting this uh, uh, critic about how can you portray a place that is so politically problematic and tainted in such colorful, large scale uh, pictorial images. And for me, that was the place I was kind of trying to, to balance. Um, I'll get back to it slightly later in this presentation and uh, another American photographer that like I find really kind of uh, inspiring the way that he speaks about his work which is very simplistic but very deep at the same time Robert Adams uh, and I just brought here a, a quote from one of his books uh, landscape pictures can offer us three varieties geography autobiography and metaphor geography if taken alone sometimes boring autobiography is frequently trivial and metaphor can be dubious but taken together, the three kinds of information strengthen each other and reinforce what we all work to keep intact, an affection for life. So maybe the affection for life is not that relevant, uh, but I guess at the end of the day, 
making pictures, you want to be out there in the world and you need that kind of affection for life, I guess, to keep encounter the world. But what I want to jump from that quote is to the element of uh, autobiography and how for me this project became to come, kind of like came along uh, because making pictures of landscape as political or problematic the landscape it is, uh, it's really hard with a single image, uh, especially when you're using color and large format and uh, this ambition to create pictorial images. It's really hard to kind of expand the narrative or to open up like a new frontiers for discussions. So for me, one way to approach that was to address that idea of autobiography. And this image here that you are seeing now is maybe the, the most uh, kind of uh, personal image in the series. This is uh, the kibbutz dining hall. I grew up in a kibbutz, which I believe uh, uh, you probably have heard of, of before. Like in many parts of the world, people have no idea what a kibbutz is. But just in case nobody heard of that, uh, uh, so a kibbutz used to be this kind of uh, alternative uh, communist socialist idea of basically uh, something that the Zionist movement took from the Russian uh, revolution and created those communities that were both uh, like villages, like a place where people live, but it was also combined with armed forces and and basically used as a, uh, fortresses on the new frontiers of the Israeli uh, borders or what became to be the Israeli borders. So it was a place of uh, sharing. So nobody would get like everybody was equal and everything is shared. And the idea obviously is something, uh, something of a utopia and growing up in this environment was definitely to an extent a utopia. But as I was uh, through my adolescence, this whole situation kind of uh, started to change very dramatically, uh, financial reasons, but also the political environment in the world at the time, the collapse of the Soviet Union, this whole idea of socialism uh, kind of made its way to more capitalist uh, entity in Israel and the kibbutz where I grew up, but also a lot of other kibbutzim uh, were kind of starting to diminish and had to transform, uh, privatizing and changing the structure. So the kibbutz dining hall used to be this beating heart of the community where everybody gathered for like breakfast, lunch, dinner, and where all the social activities are happening. Uh, but back then, in during the change, this whole place kind of ceased to uh, function. So. Uh, it kind of remain uh, this white elephant or this elephant in the middle of the, the village that is now dysfunction. Uh, and I went back there a few years ago and I was working on this project and this landscape painting on the wall is probably the first image of landscape that I remember. Uh, this is a very kind of peripheral uh, place. So I didn't really have a lot of exposure to the art scene and Israel in general is not that uh, multicultural uh, back then, but I guess today is a little bit different in Tel Aviv. But anyway, uh, so this picture, I, I always remember there's this like uh, idea of the landscape or the place that represents itself. And when I exhibited one, this work like a few years back, I was contacted by the artist who painted the painting and I always had this like kind of alienated feeling from it, but I didn't know exactly why. And if you see the, the, the line on the, on the soil, it looked like a tractor, but then she contacted me and she told me that her son died in the Lebanon war. And after he died, she would go back to the border and paint, repaint like the, the landscape where he allegedly stepped through. So those marks on the ground are actually tank marks and this whole kind of added layers, which is not completely relevant to the story that I'm telling you, but it's something that I find really interesting when you think of a place like Israel and how uh, the place has so many layers of history and conflict and how even something as simplistic as that, like a decoration on the dining hall wall, which is now not even existing anymore, the whole kind of idea. So even that kind of 
uh, have its history. Um, so the break, maybe the metaphorical break that I'm talking about, maybe starts with this, the place that I grew up in, the kibbutz, and the way that this whole kind of the social uh, reality that I knew kind of ceased to exist and forced me to later on find new uh, a new place for myself because this whole place was not really functioning. And I moved to Tel Aviv after my military service and I kept going back and photographing around the same area in the north of Israel on the border with Lebanon where I grew up. Uh, and the more I went there, I realized that it's like to begin with, I thought more in like kind of National Geographic style, I'm going to make beautiful pictures. But every picture I took or everywhere I went, the more I was more engaged with my research and stuff. I realized that there is no place that is not kind of contaminated with this conflict that has been going on for many years. Uh, this place is literally one kilometer from the kibbutz, and it was a village named uh, Tel Kedes, uh, an Arab village that in '48 was uh, demolished, like in the war. The people escaped to Lebanon to a refugee camp. Uh, the Palestinians. Uh, and the kibbutz, basically, where I grew up, the people who were part of this battle in '48, they established the kibbutz that I grew up in. So basically, the kibbutz is sitting on the same soils of this uh, village that is now uh, not there anymore. And just another quick story: I was when I made this picture, I was standing there up up on the hill very early in the morning, and I see this. Uh, this uh, man coming towards me and this is now a grazing area for cows so to begin with i thought it's is maybe the guy who is in charge and he want to tell me off that i'm not supposed to be in this place but i found out that it's actually uh he was an israeli arab and he told me a story about his grandfather was from this village and every year on his birthday his grandfather's birthday he'd go up there to remember but also hope that one day he'll be back there and rebuild his home and that was kind of like a nice encounter but very weird because when you think about what that actually means uh, if he goes back there where is my family go and can we ever share this land uh, this very kind of uh, small strip of land uh, raises a lot of questions about uh, legitimacy and ownership of the place but also the future of it and the two narratives that collapse. Uh, so yeah, um, so started working a lot in the north, but then I expanded my journey along the uh, other frontiers and keeping this uh, uh, ambition to create something that looks like a postcard, but also have this sign of the conflict or this um, collusion of, of sentiments or feelings. This is in the Golan Heights. It's uh, the Golan Heights is basically what separates Israel and Syria. And it's a uh, occupied land from the 67. Uh, it's a place where a lot of uh, people died during the short Israeli history in the war. And what you see, the fences are actually uh, Beyond the fences where the flowers are is a minefield and the red triangle is basically how it marks in the land. And I always found that like driving around and it's all colorful and pretty and the flowers are out and it's all green. But then these red triangles, which also look like flowers, kind of resemble that reality of the place. In this case, I took two triangles. So I added another triangle and I created the symbol of the uh, the Star of David, which is also with the colors in the back, kind of create a lot of uh, symbolism to the Jewish history as well with the uh, with its history before the Israeli state. Um, throwing you back to a little bit of uh, background, Joel Sternfeld again, uh, in another project that I really like of his uh, on this site, so where he basically travel around the US and picture, depict places which to begin with look very kind of mundane, daily 
uh, on special places, but then he juxtaposed it with text to kind of reveal uh, a tiny fact of a, of a crime that happened in this place. Uh, and I like what he said about the project experience that taught me again and again that you can never know what lies beneath surface or behind the facade. Our sense of place, our understanding of photographs of the landscape is inevitably limited and fraught with misreading. So this project was important for me when I, uh, when I approached uh, my work and this is the one I think, Jan, you mentioned in your introduction, Stone Cove Trail in N N Zaytim, or the Arab name is Enel Zaytun. Um, as you mentioned, this was an Arab village. It was also uh, uh, destroyed in the war in 48. And I was kind of looking for those, uh, for remains of the places in the landscape, as, as I did with the other picture I showed. Um, and then I became slowly less interested in finding those remains and photograph them, but more in what you cannot really see. Um, but I couldn't not notice doing this research and looking for those signs. The stones themselves that carve the trail are carved stones. So those were basically taken from the remains of the village that were there to create this uh, path in the forest which looks like a European kind of naive forest. Uh, and again, like an Israeli kind of psychic, uh, the forest, the European forest is not naive, obviously for other reasons. But for me, this combination of, again, this early morning light is very kind of uh, uh, seductive uh, image with this uh, uh, juxtaposed with uh, a factual comment that kind of changed the reading or the encounter of the viewer with the work is very important. And this is how the work was uh, shown last year in the, in the new contemporaries here in London. Uh, and you have it also in the gallery today uh, in that scale, slightly different uh, out, uh, production, but yeah, this encounter with the work, like something that invites you in and then lure you and force you to then read the little bit of the index, which kind of uh, change the way you interact or read the work, but also the rest of the works, because uh, those are all individual images, but obviously together they uh, meant to create something bigger. Symbolism is very strong again. Uh, this is very local maybe, but the pine trees in the center, uh, not the pine, the cypress tree that is in the center, kind of holding the ground, surrounded by olive trees. So the cypress is a symbol of a, so a fallen soldier in Israel. You'll find them a lot in cemeteries. And the olive trees are both Palestinian symbol, but also a symbol of peace and very kind of related to the area. So this, fight over the land, which the trees kind of symbolize, is obviously referring to a wider idea. I started obviously revisiting a lot of the places uh, and kind of noticing changes during the seasons. And in this case, it was important for me to show the duration. So the times it passes between uh, those images, because I'm talking about a journey, but obviously it's not a linear journey that you go from A to B. It's a continuous kind of journey of encountering and researching and going back to places that you've already been to. Um, this is a work that I really like from this body of work. It's uh, basically what you're looking at is a, a wall painting, mural in a hotel in Tiberia, which is uh, a city to the Sea of Galilee where Jesus walked on water. It's a very kind of tainted with history and symbolism place. But in reality, I found it fascinating because for all its potential uh, for tourism and culture, it's quite uh, religiously orthodox and, and failing financially, like the economy there. And this hotel was built in the early, I think in the 20s. And, and later on, 
uh, and later on it was abandoned, but the painting on the wall here is something that was uh, is very kind of like a Zionist uh, depiction of the of the local landscape, this empty landscape, which is obviously was was never in reality empty and, uh, and not inhabited as it depicted. But the Israeli narrative kind of like to portray that in that way, and I found it again uh, very symbolic or ironic that this place is now, or the idea is kind of abandoned and other layers are adding onto it just because we're photographers. So a little bit of a uh, uh, um, location tour just to show you what it looks like in reality and, and what the photography can make of it. And again, this this is in the West Bank. Uh, this used to be a Jordanian military base. And now it's kind of like an in-between land in the back on the left. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but those red uh, balls on the on the wire are basically to to alarm uh, fighter jets flying very low. Uh, that there are cables over there, and the border is in the back. So. This is near Jericho, slightly near the Dead Sea. And, and again, this history of the place and so many cultures and religions are claiming parts of it. Uh, and again, the irony of the place, like the theater of uh, the Orthodox uh, Greek uh, uh, monastery that is there. And again, it's like this tourist attraction, but then it always, it, it, in, the, in the moment of making this picture, was important for me to kind of like uh, take a picture of it when it's in the process of, uh, of of building, which I think till today is not really being uh, completed. But it's like this thing that is always stuck between its history and its future, and the present is always kind of like tainted. Um, water park near the the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is also suffering from. Uh, ecological crisis and uh, withdrawal of the water, which causes uh, sinkholes and insurance issues. So together with the conflict, this place is basically situated in the West Bank, in a place that is kind of in, in between Israel and Palestine. So it's mm, during the Intifada, like in the, in the 80s and then later in, the, in 2000, this place became less attractive for both sides to visit because of the risk that it involves, but also the situation of the Dead Sea and the insurance kind of caused it to close. And this monumental kind of look of, of those places, like a, a civilization that used to exist and is no more. Obviously, the lack of people in the pictures. Uh, I had a lot of uh, uh, ideas referring to the kind of biblical sense of the place going back in history and how the places, when you read in the Bible, the stories about the place and the desert. And so I was really kind of attracted to create that sense of like timeless place. But obviously here, what you're looking at is a tourist attraction of Bedouin tent, which is uh, for tourism. But when you juxtapose it with uh, uh, other images or the watchtower images, it obviously looks like a military base. And I guess all of that region is kind of like military uh, control. This is my image of the great open space. Again, referring to uh, Robert Frank and the American road trip. The boundaries, a lot of the images are kind of lacking the skylight or the the horizon uh, here is more kind of straightforward, but the idea of the fences and how the land is divided and, and the barrier and the separation wall, which are uh, monuments in the landscape that I refer to. I made a book from this project, which is uh, still in the making. And uh, this is my camera that I used location, four by five cameras. So all of these images are made with large format and film. 
uh, which kind of slows you down. And also the pleasure of looking at the world upside down is something that I really enjoy. Um, and this is how it looks when I take a picture on my phone. This is my uh, digital Polaroid, basically. And do we have time for uh, another short project? Yes. Yeah. All right, so I will jump to another place. Bear with me. And in 2018, I moved to the UK, London, and, and I was really, uh, after a long time, really good, good few years of dealing with uh, the Israeli landscape where I felt quite comfortable. I had this uh, both critique, but also a lot of empathy and, and intimate knowledge. I moved to England and wanting to work with landscape, I had a real kind of challenge finding my way around or an entry level, an, an entry point to a project here. Um, so the idea that I came with uh, during this process of doing my degree here is something that I took from my Israeli background, this idea of knowing the land as uh, something that suggests belonging and entitlement and ownership something that is very kind of Israeli culturally based about knowing the territory because it's such a small place. You need to really walk the land to know it. And, and that's something that was really strong in Israeli culture and coming to England and knowing nothing about the geography or the history, I felt like that might be a good way to kind of uh, start a project. So I had this idea of mapping the English island and driving to different places and making work in the landscape. Uh, and then work started to accumulate it and my research started to be diverted more into kind of the history of painting or depiction of landscape in English culture, which is obviously relevant to the picture that you see in the back of my head uh, of the constable here. Um, This is the Constable, the Haywine, which is probably the most kind of famous English landscape painters and the most famous painting of his. And this is a depiction of like, it's in a few weeks, it's gonna be 200 years old. Uh, but Constable, uh, even at the time of making this work, he used to go back to his childhood memories and places where he grew up. But in his depiction, if you think of the time when those images were made, it was during the Industrial Revolution and a lot of social uh, rebel were going on in the land. But in his pictures, it's kind of like portrayed as, as he had it in his mind, like as a child. So more naive and, and the relationship with the land is also is very harmonic between the man and the nature uh, in this agricultural land. And for me, trying to kind of find those places for myself, find this harmony, find this color palette that Constable used. Uh, I started to driving around, but what I constantly found that I'm being uh, restricted off the land. So fences and barbed wires and the land in England I found is very much owned. 94% of it is in private ownership, which kind of push a lot of the people off the land of most part of it. Um, and that's something that I found quite interesting. And uh, I started to, I guess, something to re that relates to my project from Israel from along the break, this idea of the boundaries that were now putting me outside or kind of clearly keeping me outside of the landscape. And these works that you see here with the banana peel and the oranges was uh, uh, Kind of like I did with the work with the minefields in Israel, with the triangles, I think, looking back at it, but it was kind of a spontaneous frustration act. I couldn't get into the, to the land, to the water and to the image that I wanted to make. And what I
slyší? Hi, Roy, uh, we lost you for a second. Uh, we, we lost you at the fence with the, uh, with the oranges and the banana. <laughs> if you could, please, <laughs> could, could bring us back. And, and at the moment, uh, maybe your microphone is off. If you please can check. Oh, yeah, yes, I just need uh, yes. I just need to be able to share my screen and then I can Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. All right. Do you see my screen? No. Can you see my screen now? Yes, yes, yes perfect. Okay. Thank you. So yeah, I was saying that uh, uh, I was waiting here for the light. I was pointing my camera, uh, the large format, at the fences, and I was waiting for the light, which in England is very tricky because it changes a lot and there's a lot of clouds and movement. Uh, so while I was having my breakfast, I kind of thought playfully to place those uh, leftovers on the fence, which was to begin with more colorfully kind of uh, alter the the color space of the scene but in hindsight i realized it's it might be a way of uh, kind of uh, insert my present into the to the landscape and, and change the landscape or its depiction or its narrative and one word that really influenced me or uh, this is peter kennard going back to the hay wine and peter kennard was my tutor at the college and this is a work he made in the 1980, but his attempt of, with a collage, photo collage of uh, altering this nationalist, very nationalist picture, the haywine, and inserting it, with what was very relevant at the time, the uh, nuclear missiles that were placed in the England Island, American missiles uh, during the Cold War. Uh, so he used photo collage, but uh, this idea of inserting something that was not there in order to alter the landscape is something that I found really intriguing. And I started doing it myself with different ways. So keep focusing on these barriers in the land and inserting certain elements or changing things that will suit me and my language. So the private land sign is something I bought some signs on Amazon and I would start to insert them in different places, again, to play with the color of the scene, playing on this very pictorial kind of uh, look, but also inserting uh, something that was, for me, really relevant at the time. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, uh, Thomas Gainsborough, this is very much, uh, if you think of English landscape and depiction of landscape, the landscape here was always kind of used as a background to uh, portraiture, not just in England, but in England, the idea of ownership of the land goes hand to hand with the way the landscape itself was depicted. Uh, in here, you can see the couple, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Andrew, sitting in the uh, land, uh, taking the portrait, basically showing this is all us. So I found that relationship between land and landscape or the depiction of landscape very interesting. And this is me painting the puddle that you just saw. Uh, Walk to Paradise Garden is how I titled this work. and. It's referring to a very famous photograph of uh, Eugene Smith, Walk to Paradise Garden. I don't know if you see the resemblance, but this idea of uh, Eugene Smith was a war photographer. And this is a picture I think he made when he was injured in the war and he was recovering. And this is his kids going through the tunnel into the light. So something that resembled this hope of humanity at the time, or maybe the lack of hope, but still the next generation. And for me, it was really interesting this, uh, when you think of, of, of landscape and the generational kind of history of it and the access to not just the land, but a lot of resources that uh, a lot of people have in the English island, uh, ideas of equality and such.
something that I realized early on in the process of making this work uh, is that it had to have something that combined this seduction element with alienation. So there's something really alluring in the images, but also a lot of dark, uh, using a lot of shades, using the barriers, using this uh, kind of positioning yourself in a certain way that kind of highlights the conflict that I had. And again, the idea of the open road and the open spaces. This is my, uh, my horse to the journey, the car that I used to travel the English island for over a year. Here at the, if you can see on the, on the, on the ground, by the fence, there's a newspaper that I brought with me. It was the day of Brexit, when Brexit was approved in England. And the title in the Daily Mail was uh, A New Dawn for Britain, which I thought was uh, quite ironic with the, it's hard to see in this picture, but with the cliffs of Dover, the white cliffs of Dover, which are really kind of like a monumental uh, landscape, landmark, uh, that have a lot of symbolism in the UK. Uh, little did I know that a month later, uh, COVID will happen and a new dawn kind of got a very different uh, uh, context. Um, I think this is maybe the kind of most extreme intervention that I introduced to the landscape with the round mirror. I was looking a lot of titles of romantic paintings, like how the, the romantics uh, used titling. And I came across a book of Caspar uh, David Friedrich and a picture in it called Landscape with Old Trees and a Hunter. And again, it's not a very good quality, but you'll find it quite hard to spot the hunter. And that's something that I found intriguing at the time, like where is the hunter? Like this is a landscape picture, but there's a hunter here. Why is the hunter here? Where is the hunter? And I managed to find the hunter and it looks like he's pointing it at you, the viewer. Um, and I kind of like that idea that David Friedrich, Caspar David Friedrich was trying to, I thought, trying to get rid of the human figure uh, when he's depicting landscape, like to give the landscape its place, but he still had to use the human figure to kind of make it relevant in the art world. And for me, it was a way using a mirror to kind of put myself or insert myself into a new landscape, maybe trespass into a new uh, territory, but also into like the art history. So this is my version of landscape with oak trees and hunter. And I think my research is still kind of evolving in that sense, like this uh, moving between romantic ideas and depiction of landscape and encountering a new territory as someone who is an outsider is something that I uh, kind of still feel I have some something to explore. This was earlier in August uh, in what we, in an exhibition in London that I had. This is just uh, a few tasters uh, my dad was with me here, down here on the part of the journey. So the journey itself, I think, is very important for me in this making as a whole. Um, yes, that's my uh, work in a short introduction. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rui. Um, I think now we have a... a, a a moment to uh, accept questions uh, from our audience. Wojciech, um, do you have a question later? I, I actually have a question. <laughs> um, many things. Uh, it's uh, pretty intense, Rui. Um, 
And and at at some point I was I was uh, wondering um, with with what uh, sentiment do you tr did you travel along the break five times you said uh, as sort of like a road trip, uh, imagining the sort of romantic idea of the American road trip, uh, thinking about um, symbols that you en encounter, even adding elements to the landscape, and it's in sort of in 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 a, in a in a way, it all started with uh, your memory of this uh, landscape painting in the dining hall of the kibbutz where you grew up. And even that image that shows a landscape is completely, um, uh, has a very, very intense and complex uh, meaning. Like basically it's a, an image that commemorates the, the, the death of a son of, a, of, a, of an artist. Um, so I, I guess this is the question that I want to ask. What is the with with what sentiment do you uh, travel along the break and even uh, in England to make your work? So yeah, back in Israel, I think uh, the sentiment of the work was something that started for me early on, like my early days. Uh, growing in a kibbutz, in this remote place, in kind of surrounded by nature, but also uh, surrounded with borders and boundaries. So the kibbutz is actually located on the border with Lebanon, which means that you can go out of the kibbutz and find yourself in nature if you go uh, to the east or to the south. But if you want to try and go north or west, you very quickly will hit a uh, dead end and the border itself. So this idea of restriction and also what these borders meant, because it was at the time when I was growing up, uh, the war in Lebanon was still ongoing, uh, missiles and alarms and bomb shelters were part of my childhood, which were very much symbolized by this border or the prox proximity to the border. So, uh, and then going uh, at 18, uh, to a mandatory military service and combat unit and finding yourself uh, drugged between between the different frontiers but also working in the West Bank in like uh, civil population and realizing that the narrative that I was told growing up in Israel as an Israeli in the Zionist movement, a very idealistic community, this narrative is way more... Uh, there's more to this narrative than... I was told, and a lot of Israelis are told. And the other narrative, which is parallel, uh, is, is often hidden or uh, destroyed. And that's something that both sides are doing, trying to erase each other narrative. So this idea of erasure is something that led me to the work with the path in the forest. So how the landscape, which was like the place that is depicted there is actually a national park. And I have memories as a kid going there on holidays and playing around and there's a playground and barbecue. And we used to go there as like a outing day in the nature. But then you think about this nature or your memories from it and, and the narrative that you were prevented from exploring because it doesn't really suit the ideals of the society you're living in and the ideals that you need to have when you are going to the army and serving your country. Um, so the sentiments, I think, during my army kind of military service and later on moving to Tel Aviv, starting uh, art course and research and becoming a, mo a lot more politically involved kind of led me to decisions about the fact that I didn't want to serve in the army anymore, like as a as a reserve force, like I didn't want to go to the West Bank and, and be a soldier in the Israeli army. So I had a lot of confrontations with my surroundings and myself about this idea of identity. And I think identity maybe is the sentiment, like this exploring your own identity and, and the place you're growing up or you're living at. Um, but still, I had this idea of the American road trip and I wanted to make beautiful images and I loved the land. So I would go to the desert and I felt like I do belong there and it is part of my heritage and it is part of my history and culture 
and I have good memories of it. So this sentiment, I think, of all this duality between empathy and belonging, and then the idea that there are a lot wrong with the situation and the reality of this place and the narrative that I was told kind of pushed me to start investigating uh, the other side's narrative and going to those places and confronting those uh, ideas. And again, it's very problematic, I guess, because photography is a language and image making is a language and the way you choose to portray something, uh, it's hard because on one hand, when I'm telling you the story, it highlights some problematicity, but when I'm not there to speak for the image, maybe he does the opposite. So it's something that I was faced with early on in this progress, but uh, the decision I made is that I'd rather create uh, an image that first, first satisfy my aesthetics, but also, uh, also it's more likely to gain attention to the context using a very strong photographic uh, uh, visual language, which I felt like I could do and was pushing myself more and more to kind of exploit that. Uh, and I find that later on, yes, it is encountering some problematities, like some people uh, would not see the criticism or because of the nature of the images, but still this conversation keeps rising. So, uh, yeah, uh, it's a tricky question about the sentiment, but I guess the sentiment is there. It's this duality of criticism and empathy together. Um, yeah, I, I think with uh, the, the work along the, the break, you, uh, as I said, it's, it's very, very intense, but I think the intensity is, uh, is uh, very important uh, in, in, let's say, uh, showing um, the, it's not only the landscape, the landscape becomes a, you know, a, a sort of generator of many meanings, both, uh, let's say, historical uh, and symbolical. Um, and political. I mean, that's the, that's the whole thing that I that I constantly feel like you're, uh, you're, you're you know, it's it's sort of like a constant uh, unstable ground. Um, and and I think one of the last times I was in in uh, Jerusalem, uh, they were they are building the Museum of Tolerance, uh, a giant new museum. But in order to make the museum, to build the museum, they had to move uh, one of the Arab uh, cemeteries, which is, of course, uh, uh, interesting if you want to build a museum of tolerance, that you actually uh, are sort of intolerant against a certain uh, group of people. Um, and uh, with uh, the English uh, works, uh, I found it also interesting that you mentioned uh, Constable and how he would go back to his childhood to make his paintings, but uh, he would uh, do it from a specific point of view, sort of like, again, this romanticized point of view, uh, sort of uh, ignoring the industrialization of that moment. Um, and when you encounter the landscape, it's always fenced off. There's always this boundary. It's uh, sort of unreachable. Um, Great, really interesting. I will uh, uh, let uh, Wojciech ask a question now. I, I, I would love to. I'm afraid we are running out of time and we are not. <laughs> Five minutes, okay. Well, um, I was wondering because you are uh, mentioning Stephen Shore and I was also a little bit thinking of uh, Geert Hoyeris, for example, with uh, uh, like photographers which uh, often have something very uh, disturbing in their in their images, uh, in their images of uh, of landscape, and that's something what applies to you uh, also very much. Um, like uh, there is something something there, there are, like there are beautiful image images, but there is something wrong in them. And um, I was um, wondering also about uh, your approach of the work. Is it is it like happening more and more often that you are uh, adding the the aspects of uh, uh, of this disturbance? Because it seemed like in the in the in the Israel uh, series, uh, it happened incidentally that you have. Uh, Altered the the, uh, the reality, and 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 in the English series, uh, you are more uh, like uh, 
adding things and, 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 and meanings. Yeah, uh, in Israel, I, I didn't have this uh, urge to intervene so much because the place is so uh, loaded for me, like because I have this uh, knowledge of the place and the history. So I didn't like when I was looking more as a monumental, like looking at things or trying to make monuments of this culture that is like on, on its verge in Israel. And when I moved here and I started to try and do use the same mechanism of making images, I felt very alienated from the subject because I didn't have that knowledge of history or, or culture or the place. So it was very kind of random. You go somewhere, you find something that looked like an image potentially, uh, but there was something missing. Uh, and going back to this idea of mapping, like I'm going back from somewhere that used to be a British colony, going into the English uh, landscape and claiming it back or, or claiming my presence here. So this idea of leaving a mark, the intervention, I think, kind of an act of mapping in the early stages and then became a little bit more playful. But I found that later on in the process, I kind of stopped doing those because, because they were becoming a little bit repetitive. Um, and also, I don't know, it, it, back in, it's a good question, but, uh, but yeah, to begin with, it was something I felt I needed to do here because of the lack of, of intimacy that was a way of making the work more performative and kind of work in the, in the scene in a way that will kind of claim my presence or the way I was trespassing into some of the places and mark it, mark the presence of that encounter that I had, if that answer. Uh, any any questions from the audience? Uh, I think um, we still have a little bit of time. Uh, not enough time to give the assignment. Hmm? Rui, we, we have to um, let you go. <laughs> Our next speaker, also based in London, by the way, is uh, is waiting. She will be uh, called in in a, in a minute from now. Um, are you still going to be around later today for the group discussion? We are st we are basically uh, uh, curious about the assignment that you want to give to the students of uh, photography. Uh, I would be, but in and out at some point. Would you like me to uh, give the assignment? It's a it's a slideshow, so you can take a screenshot of that as well. Yeah. Can you see it? Yes. So I was uh, thinking of something I can give the students in the kind of in, in line with what I was doing or the, inspired by my project. Uh, and I would like the students to create a body of work of between 8 and 15 photographic images, followed by a short text of like about 200 words describing your subject and motivation. A personal journey should be at the heart of the project. Think of the world boundaries and where in your life you encounter them, from physical borders to more personal metaphoric boundaries, and use it in your research as a guideline for your upcoming journey. Uh, this could be a documentation of a physical journey or a collection of images that will be tied together into metaphoric journey by your written narrative. Uh, as this is a personal project, attempt to portray your personal point of view, like where you stand, what do you have to say, what is your position, do you criticize it, are you empathetic toward it, like think in less terms of sentiment as you mentioned before. And think of the relationship between the visual and the narrative you are creating. So those two should be kind of uh, fought through together or not together at the same time. But the connection between words or context and the visual is important in this journey assignment. And whether you're going on a road trip across Europe or working on the outskirts of town, following a bus line in the city, or making an imaginary journey from home, uh, it's important you can explain your motivation and research as to why you are doing whatever it is that you're doing on your journey assignment. I hope this is doable. 
That would be it. Um, well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, Rui, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your participation. It was great having you here. Um, you. Uh, I'm sorry we uh, uh, have to leave you now and go uh, uh, go further with the symposium, but um, stay uh, stay with us. And uh, I hope uh, maybe we can, you can join us uh, in the evening with uh, with a discussion. Thank you. Thank you. So, hi, Rosalie. Nice to see hi. you. Uh, hi. Exactly. Welcome to uh, to our um, afternoon set of the symposium, and um, um, it's great to have you at our faculty for the first time in this way. I hope it will work out to have you here next semester. And um, I pass now the microphone to uh, to Jan, uh, who will. Uh, give us a brief introduction on your work. Thank you. Hi, Rosalie. Um, Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are you doing? Um, dear audience, we now welcome our four guests of the Photography Symposium, Rosalie Yu. Uh, originally from Taiwan, she is currently doing a residency in London and is based in New York City, where she is a member of the 12-month program of the New Museum's New Inc which is an incubator for art, design, and technology, and brings together boundary-pushing professionals who are in innovating the fields of inter interactive art, gaming, architecture, film, uh, performing arts, uh, among others. Rosalie is an interdis interdisciplinary artist who graduated in 2015 from the Interactive Telecommunications Program at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts, and holds a BA in Psychology and Film from UCLA, the University of California. To Boundaries, Poetics of Conflict, Rosalie contributed two digital sculptures from her project Close to the Body of a Stranger to the online exhibition that we created and that features a new and in reality non-existent black box space that the visitor can walk through virtually. Rosalie, so welcome to our uh, symposium of today, and I guess we are now ready to listen to your presentation. Thank you, Jen. I'm going to share my slide. Can anyone see it okay? Okay. Um, hi, my name is Rosalie Yu. Um, like what Jen just described, I'm an artist and researcher um, I'm from Taiwan, but I'm based in New York, and I'm calling you from uh, London. It's uh, from the Delphina Foundation, where I'm currently doing an artist residency. And um, today, I think I, uh, I will talk about the project that's in the exhibition and also uh, walk through other projects that's related to um, uh, to the sculptures I'm displaying and also explain that you can kind of see the trajectory of um, my career as an artist. And yeah, so just to give a little bit of context, um, uh, like what Jen described, um, I graduated um, from New York, New York University in 2015. And after that, I was doing research I was an associate researcher at the Columbia Journalism School, and my role is to bring new technology to 
uh, to the journalism school and thinking about how um, uh, how technology could help with storytelling. And uh, before that, I was also a resident at NYU. And um, I think this is just kind of explain how my work is situated. It's really process-based and research-based. Um, so just to start, um, my work and research explore a feminist take on emerging photo techniques and digitizing tools. And to do this, I often facilitate workshops and classes in which we explore the practice of reciprocity, share intimacy, and look at how cross-cultural concepts shape our understanding of them. And I then translate results into artifacts, into installations, into tutorials, into essays. And the medium that I work with the most is called photogrammetry. It's basically the practice of stitching 2D images from multiple angles into 3D objects. And you can kind of see this medium as a transitional or a liminal medium between photography and sculpture. And um, I, you can kind of see, um, well, this technique is rooted in the um, the science of measurement, and uh, because it's proximity to uh, other medium, um, there is a lot of vocabulary that I borrow from sculpture and photography when I work. And this is um, this is how it looks like in the software. You walk around the object, you take photographs from all angles, and you stitch in, you stitch them into a three D model. And um, Museums um, and museums such as uh, the Neumann Museum also use 3D scanning as a way to create artifacts for um, from their own collection. And but a lot of times, um, this bring out the question of ownership: who owns a high resolution scan like this one on the left? And is it the museum that? has the access to the artifacts or the, com the companies that produce this very expensive um, scanning technology or the culture that actually have, have um, um, that produce the artifacts themselves. And I think I bring up this um, just to give you a little bit context on the way that I work with 3D technology because I'm, I care a lot about making it more accessible. So I oftentimes open the process for people to join um, and to make the technology more transparent and which I will walk through them with you. And this is another counter example. If you are in London, you probably know the work from forensic architecture. What they do is they, um, they create a um, a tear gas canister using photogrammetry, the same techniques I was introducing. And I use that to combine with machine learning to, to, uh, to run through thousands of protest, protesting photos uh, and images and videos online to find where tear gas is being sold and being export, exported because it's not in public record. So, this is just a way for me to kind of demonstrate that scanning like any other technology, like photography is political. And the typical way of generating a photorealistic scan resembling the peeling off the skin and sewing them back together. And this kind of image generation could be seen as some, somehow violent. But at the same time, scanning is about getting all the information from the surface of an object. You can see something hollow you can see the world from the inside. And to me, that's somehow feminine and intimate. So this contradiction is what drives me to continue to investigate in this medium. So with this background knowledge, I want to start with the project, which is um, um, an extension or a previous version of what is being exhibited in the gallery, the virtual sculptures. So I've been very interested in the subject of intimacy, especially platonic and shared intimacy and how the distance between two bodies over time could be measured. 
Because when you think about embrace, it's basically the distance between two bodies over time. So although scanning is supposed to be used for still objects, I want to experiment with how it could trans how I can translate movement into material. Um, and the slides that you're seeing is just to demonstrate that uh, the process of scanning is very similar to early photography because the subject need to stay for a long time and there's even devices to hold your body posture. And so the technology, when whenever there's a new invention of new technology, um, you can kind of see how this technology kind of train our body or make our body behave in a certain way. And this, um, and in, in regarding to 3D scanning, um, you can see that the person usually have to close their eyes, wear apart and closing, or have to um, stand still for a long time. And another uh, parallel is um, uh, usually scanning, you will see people scan like a dead animal or an animal sleeping. And that is also very similar to still light paintings. So, so for me, I was looking at photogrammetry and thinking about how like I said, I, I view this as a liminal medium between sculpture and photography, and they all have their own way to convey emotion over time. And how can I borrow that, borrow this vocabulary that's already established? So, um, so this uh, the sculpture, how it was made, was very, it was a very iterate, iterated process because I was looking at long exposure. Um, you create this mess of information on the left. But if I use uh, the aesthetic of, um, uh, it's called the scanning, is basically you scan lines of pixel over time and you stack them together. So you create this continuous flow. And um, I was able to um, um, use that or borrow this language and then use that to kind of capture how embrace look like for me because um, uh, for me I think from where I'm come from um, uh, it's this sculpture is a way for me to start forming description to understand the lack of physical interaction between people back home which is Taiwan and how body forms and posture or passion are rarely depicted in our art history and how cross-cultural some concepts shape our understanding of intimacy. And this is the version that you see in the, in the gallery. And uh, um, the, in, the, in this case, this is an extension of this project. I take all my own models so people can walk in and to be wrapped around by the embrace. And uh, I, if I have time, I can explain a little bit more on how these models are made, but basically it was, inspired by photogrammetry, but it's not made by photogrammetry in the end because the, the way that is captured, it create um, the model is not clean enough to, to print. But um, if people are interested, I can talk more about it in the Q&A. So um, the next project I choose to talk about is called Knowing Together. I want to talk about this project because it's basically an extension of the project that you see in the exhibition. So instead of inviting people to, uh, to have a one-on-one -on -one capture with me, I open up the process. I bring around 40 people uh, into a sand room with me to do a one-day workshop. So I'll explain that workshop with you. So like I said, I'm very interested in shared intimacy and um, how to conduct or how to lead a workshop like that. And so uh, imagine you're in the workshop. The first, the first part of the workshop is uh, we learn how to establish a safe space. We learn how to give and receive attention to a total stranger by eye contact and then and embrace. And then we stand in a circle, a pair of strangers um, embrace in the center while the 40 participants take turns snapping uh, photographs and pass the camera to the next person. And this video uh, kind of gives you an idea of how the camera traveled during the uh, during the workshop. So you can see, like again, in this photo, one person only take one photo and pass the camera to the next person. 
and in here is a bird's eye view. Each dot is where people take photos, and that's and the line is how the camera traveled. So because the the capturing process is long, it depends on how long, how much time people take to take uh, to take photographs. So sometimes it take, takes ten minutes. So the subject in the middle, they have to stay still for ten minutes, and. In this, in this embrace, you can see an opening on the right side. That's because during the capture process, um, the hug let go. So you see this opening on the right side. And I want to be true to whatever happened during the, the capture. So a lot of time is thinking about how to work with missing data, how to preserve all the imperfections during the embrace and how missing data in a lot of times can actually sheds more light into what happened um, during a capture. So like I said, um, a lot of time is thinking about how to preserve them in the printing process. And so I, um, all those photos are uh, stitched together and uh, turned into 3D model and being 3D printed. So these are the data set that uh, we gathered during the workshop. And so I think I, I want to show this photo because I think uh, photogrammetry is interesting because it's kind of, you can see it as a way to decenter the solitary photographer or a solitary observer when we are taking photos because you are taking it from all angles. And in this case, each photo is taken by a different person. And I'm all, also interesting to, interested to think about how the mechanics of capture multiple perspective can offer us a way to think about knowledge formation, you know, just um, or embrace pluralism rather than just one person, one view. So it's like providing the process itself kind of provides a more philosophical framework for us to think about um, knowledge formation. And um, if I if I have time, I can talk about the next project or we can uh, open up for questions, however it works. We still have time. Okay. So um, the next project is kind of related uh, uh, to the, the assignment I will be talking about in the end. Um, as part of the residency here at Delphina, I'm running a lot of workshops online. Uh, the, rep, the workshop is called Photographic Needing Club. is very much a, continua a continuation of a knowing together. It's also um, uh, testing the limits of um, mechanical objectivity and thinking about how do I combine the science of measurement with uh, the knowledge um, of our knowledge to a space that's more embodied, that's more local. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So um, I, like I said, I created this Needing Club. I use the name Needing Club. It's about a group of people come together, make something by hand from start to finish. But in this case, instead of yarn, we are needing to get our images. It's still using photogrammetry and just using the mechanics as a as a metaphor to think about how um, we can look at digitizing tools from a more uh, a feminist uh, lens and also reframing digitizing tool as a digital craft. And so in the workshop, uh, we think about, we use our camera to capture our spaces and or we kind of think about um, other more are there different ways we can observe our place that we have been, we have, we are inhabiting for so long, especially I think during the pandemic, um, um, uh, the space or the place, the space I am zooming in with you right now um, uh, is, takes on different meaning. And because we have been spending, uh, spending time in here for so long. So, um, Part of the workshop is to think about how to use the process of uh, 3D scanning, which is taking a lot of photographs of the space to kind of defamiliarize um, the relationship between you and the space. 
uh, which I will use visuals to explain what I mean. Um, so uh, over here, you see this is the process of stitching photos in the software. And, and this is the end result of, from one of the participants. And what I'm really interested in is using the process um, of uh, photogrammetry to create this data portrait of how people capture their space. And so again, this is, um, this is a bird's eye view of a diagram. The black square is the laptop, location of laptop. The triangle is where the person started taking the first photo of their space. And then the, the points are where they choose to capture and you can kind of see how they move. And the outer rectangle is the, the shape of the room. And this is another version. This is, I overlay all of the participants uh, a data portrait on the top of each other and using laptop as an anchor to kind of align them. And I kind of, I like how this look like because it's almost, you can kind of see a pattern starts to emerge and almost like time and distance collapse for, and there is a sense of togetherness for a group of people that's isolated, um, but connected at the same time. And uh, I, so I ran a few workshops before and these are some of the results. Um, I, and so in the workshop, we practice how to observe our space through um, hand drawings, also through 3D scanning, which is what you're seeing on the right. And this is some of the results people did. Um, And uh, the last project that's also related to my research is to think about uh, mirrors. I think when Jane told me about uh, the, the thing of the, of the exhibition, I was thinking a lot about borders and artists versus the state um, because I, I had a bit of visa problems for the last year and I wasn't able to enter um, enter the United States for a long time. And, and I was also thinking a lot about uh, mirrors, which is all mirrors is something that's always presented in the camera. Uh, a camera needs a mirror to function, but mirrors in 3D scanning is uh, a glitch factor. You cannot include anything that's reflective in the mirror. And so I, I was thinking about how um, mirrors, uh, it's a way, it's, it's a glitch factor that's not recognizable for a camera, but it's a way that uh, because we are reflected by the mirror, the data capture or the person who's doing the 3D scanning because the mirrors are, are made visible in in the final final model itself. So this is what it looks like um, in the software. So um, I am doing a project about um, uh, introducing this glitch factor into the software, just to break the software uh, to break the software as a way to see how the software work. And this is uh, me. Um, because there's a mirror present in the space that you can actually see the person who's capturing the space in the 3D model itself. And I think I want to reflect back to uh, what I said about borders is I think a lot of times um, for, uh, for artists like me to stay in a foreign country, a lot of time we have to make ourselves legible to the government so that they're able to um, you know, determine if you are a real artist. And I think, uh, but a lot of times to be a creative person that you want to have some kind of um, uh, flexibility in, in what, who, what you want to create or who you want to be. And I think uh, making this project is kind of a way for me to kind of reflect on this um, contradiction. 
um, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, so I think we have five minutes left. I can talk a bit about the assignment or um, Jane, I would give back to you. Thank you. I think now is a now is a great moment to uh, welcome the questions of uh, our audience. Um, I will start with uh, a question, if you don't mind, Rosalie. Um, yes. Uh, it's very intriguing. Um, I, I actually, um, I, w I was thinking about uh, you know the subtitle of this project is uh, poetics of conflicts and um, how in uh, your work and also in, in your process, um, sort of this, this idea of imperfections become a quality of the um, collaborative making of uh, an artwork, which I like very much. Um, I was thinking like, you know, the, the, an embrace, a staged embrace, sort of as a, let's say, performance, uh, uh, and as a subject for a documentation via photogrammetry, um, which is a participatory process in the physical space, becomes then, or is then introduced into the digital process and system uh, that sort of adds a whole new layer of uh, fragility to the project. Um, and I was also thinking about, uh, you know, there's okay, there's an, an, another layer of fragility, but there's also an, another layer of, uh, or a, a different consciousness, um, sort of one between the participants and uh, and the intelligence of the the the, 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 the um, digital process that you uh, incorporate in your work. Um, it's not really really a question, uh, but can you reflect on what uh, what I said? <laughs> Yeah, thank you for uh, thank you for your reflection. I think um, I think what uh, for for knowing together a lot of the a lot of the thing that we are doing or what I was thinking about is really pushing the limits of um, pushing the limits of uh, mechanical objectivity is um, how how uh, photogrammetry is supposed to work. And is there a way that I can kind of open up the process and include people in the process as a way to um, kind of test if there's other ways I can work with this medium. So, and I think I, uh, I'm not sure if I, I directly answer your question, but I think a lot of time when I'm thinking about this, um, I'm thinking about this uh, book called Data Feminism is um, a book by Catherine Denisio and uh, Laura Klein is uh, they are talking about uh, when art is working with technology or working with data, um, in, in my case is capturing data, how we can open up the process, make the process visible for people. And feminist in this way is not about gender, but it's more about just, more about making it accessible. And so, and a lot of times things like emotions or affections, um, it's hard to talk about or to present in, in an artwork, especially in the academic settings. And so um, when I'm working with it, um, a lot of time is thinking about how to kind of preserve this uh, a, a effective dimensions um, in the final artwork um, and how to present it in a way, if that makes sense what I'm saying. Yeah, and, and, and um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, at, some, at some point during your presentation, you mentioned something about, um, I think it was um, in the context of knowing together um, how, uh, was it knowledge formation that you said, like how a uh, sort of like new way of mm. um, generating knowledge uh, in, in, in group rather, I mean, it's, it talks about mm -hmm. uh, decentralization, I, I believe. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think in this case, because photogrammetry is usually supposed to be done in a photo studio, usually how people do is they have around 100 cameras and then they fire at the same time. And, um, and when I talk about being accessible is everyone has a camera. So I was thinking, how can I uh, do it in the way that doesn't cost a lot of money? And um, so the workshop itself, I just had one camera and am passing the camera to a group of people. And the way that I facilitate the workshop is uh, when you observe uh, this embrace um, couple, uh, from which angle or where would you take photograph? And so because this participant take photograph of, for example, their hands, their hands will come out more, um, there will be more detail of their hand in the resulting 3D model. So the person, the participants are in a way deciding how the model should come out together as a group. And I think that's very interesting uh, when I talk about knowledge formation is um, going back to the idea of data feminism is about uh, how knowledge is always situated. It's not just one knowledge that's just truth, that's the objective truth, is always a compilation of different perspectives. And I think bring a group together to do this workshop. One is to make the process more transparent. Two is to um, kind of um, think about how, like I said, using the process as a framework to think about we can, how can we think about this medium? How can we challenge the dominant way of um, using a digitizing tool and um, and think about new modes of um, visualization, yeah. Rather than just um, extracting information, how people use, uh, a lot of people use or think about 3D scanning. Hi, Rosalie. I've, um, I have also a question of mine because um, I'm getting back a little bit to uh, uh, what uh, Johannes was telling, like, uh, uh, well, I cannot quote precisely, but uh, like uh, playing uh, uh, harmony uh, with uh, hitting the wrong keys. Uh, it, um, some of your experiments uh, uh, resemble that in, in, in a way. And I was uh, wondering, um, because you are not, uh, you are really pushing an experiment uh, kind of, and, and, and don't you miss being in control? Do I miss in control? Um, in control, can you explain control? What do you mean by control? In, in control of the, of the final outcome. Mm -hmm. Do I miss it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, of course. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's, yeah, it's uh, hard. We, we, I think yeah. we all, like artists, uh, know, know the feeling of uh, like expectation and, and, and then in the end, uh, uh, we have to adapt to uh, what the outcome is actually because it's never the same as it was expected but you are as this concerns um, fully uh, relying on 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 the uh, on the technique and on the, on and very much elements so yeah that's a very good question i think now i think more me the role as an artist is just as a facilitator who designed this machine and um, whatever come out is the result of it. And, um, and the, the way that I work is just to present the process as a result in the way. And yes, it's hard to expect what's gonna happen. Like for example, with the mirror project, um, uh, I'm basically introducing something that's not supposed to be in the frame. 
just to mess up with the technology. And then it's hard to predict sometime what is going to come out. Um, but I think I kind of see this as a experiment. So uh, in the way that the process is more important than the final results, um, I do translate whatever data that I collected during the process into an object, but the object is um, just a way to, um, to kind of bring attention to the viewer um, um, or to look at this project, but it's not the most important part of the project, if I will say that. Yeah, but I do miss having control. Yeah, it was because maybe it it's was very uh, hard. To, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, I think maybe that was uh, that was uh, like also the the thing which made me think of it because um, uh, I was wondering about these objects actually these 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 final objects uh, what kind of role they they play is it try, like uh, uh, trying to uh, uh, reach uh, something tangible and 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 visual and uh, and and solid. Um, because for me, actually, the process uh, is more intriguing than the final uh, uh, 3D prints. Mm. Yeah, I think that's. I actually like that people. When I like when people say that they they think the process is more intriguing than the final 3D prints. Um, I think it's just an entry point for people to look at a work that's more research based. Because I think um, it's it's very challenging to present a process or a, yeah to to present a process in especially in a gallery setting um, uh, and for example, knowing together project was commissioned by Teachers College and the idea was to teach a group of students a new technology and have them come back to look at what they created. And so in this case, I think creating the 3D model makes sense. It's also when you are working with um, a scanning that has been, it has been around for a while, but it's uh, compared to new compared to photography, people are, people want to see what come out of it because they don't know, uh, they don't know what's the end result. So, um, I think that's a way for uh, for me to help people understand what's the possibility of uh, this process can translate to, um, and also an entry point for people to look at something and reflect back on all this process that was uh, taking place and what happened during the, the workshop. Yeah, I think that'll be my answer. Um, I think now is a is a perfect moment to uh, introduce to the students of photography uh, your uh, assignment or the the idea that you have uh, for them to to work with them in uh, the nearby future. I will share my screen again. I hope you guys can see my screen. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, the uh, for the assignment, I actually prepare a tutorial, which uh, the tutorial is on this page. Um, you're welcome to take a photo of this to visit the site, or I can send it to Jen and and distribute to you guys. Um, this is a tutorial that I put together on how to do uh, photogrammetry yourself. It's a it's very detailed. It's step by step. So. Um, and uh, with this technical uh, background, I, um, the assignment that I have for everyone is to uh, use this technique to observe your, your own room and uh, follow the steps on how to, um, um, how to do a photogrammetry of your space. And, um, uh, the step, you can think about it as uh, a way to spray paint your room, um, to paint in all the details of your room using photographs. And then um, 
uh, I, the, the process, you can also think about it as uh, stitching photos together um, of your room. And there should be a lot of overlaps between the photos. And you can also take individual objects or scan individual objects in your room. And I put in some details here. You take around 100 photos of your room and you can also scan objects in your room, 10 photos each, and you can either capture mirrors in your room. And after you uh, take all of these photos, you can follow this instruction to, uh, to make a, a, a 3D scan of your room. And I think uh, what's interesting from this process is after you uh, you have done this, uh, 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 you have done this um, scanning process and also walk through all the um, uh, all the steps in the software. Uh, you will find that the the process of developing a uh, or making reconstructing a three D model is a lot like the process in the dark room because it's very step by step. You have to kind of change the. Um, uh, some setting to go back to the previous version and to see how you can make the 3D model better. And I am, again, everything is in the tutorial. And also, um, I think is because the software is able to, is able to calculate how you move in your space. And um, it's also interesting to, to reflect on your relationship to the space because um, uh, um, for example, when I say, when I say that is, um, for example, when you have your lights off, you know how to navigate to your bathroom in your room. And uh, through, uh, through 3D scanning, you can, um, we can kind of visualize those embodied knowledge to the space, if that makes sense. So. Yeah, like I like I mentioned, this is like one of the example that re, that's resulting from doing three D scanning the room, and that's my assignment. And again, everything is in this website. Well, Rosalie, thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking thank part you. today on the on the symposium. Um, uh, we will stay in touch, and and if everything goes well, then we will be in 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 uh, uh, in cooperation next semester, which I'm very much looking forward to. Thank you again. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Bye. So I guess right now we have. Uh, a little bit of time to have a short break, very short break, and uh, at uh, 3.30 we have scheduled a performance of uh, André Liebal, student of uh, multimedia. Okay, so short break and then we will be back soon. Thank you.
Welcome back to the um, uh, Photography Symposium. We now uh, have a short intermezzo, which is a, a performance by Andrzej Libal. Uh, the title is Political Street Organ. It is an artistic response to the current times global resurfacing of political indoctrination. The artist Andrzej Libal, a student of multimedia, experiments with old cassette players, contact microphones, discarded electric organs and other outmoded devices to create, to create multi-layered audiovisual experiences. In Political Street Organ, the artist performs a recorded fragment of a political speech, manually distorting it. His self-made box and the way to operate it are reminiscent of a street organ that normally would amplify pleasing melodies, evoking a coincidental soundtrack to urban life. In his performative gesture, Libal hijacks this device and turns it into a propaganda machine that effectively plants seeds of disunity into the minds of the passersby.
pokračování té kampaně, to je proti mě, kontinuální kampaně, to vím, jsou všechno tu kampaně. No, pane Zemo, nechci ubezpečit, že já nejsem politik, nikdy nebudu politik, nikdy, vy jste geniální retor, všichni umluvíte fantasticky a já vás spíš jako něco dělám za sebou, něco za mnou, jakáž to nevím. Lidi jsou rozumí a pochopí, že skutečně je to kampaň. Proč bych máme, já mám vzdělovat všechny moje příjmy. Sorry, jako. Vyzdělujete někomu příjmy? Nebo kdo to vyzděluje příjmy za 8 minut? Co máme vůbec za pohádku? Brutální kampaň. Je to podvrh, je to kampaň, já to odmítám. Nakoupil dluhopisy mojí firmy Agrofertu za miliardu 482 milionů 269 tisíc, kdo by si zvěstil Českou. Celá tato kampaň je celá kampaň. Protože já zkaště peníze nepočítám, jako teďka já jsem zjistil, jak jsme za příjmy. Programovaná kampaň, přesně načasovaná. To prostě je tato kampaň. Komu? Můžete mě i zabít, ale nebudu rezignovat. A neodejdu z politiky. Takovou radost nám neudělám. Budu bojovat proti tyhle kročních hydrů celý život. Celý život. Počasí kampaně. No, dobře, to je to kampaně. A považujete to skandální. Taky byla kampaně. Samozřejmě je to kampaně. Je to organizovaná kampaně. Víte, proč nepočítám peníze? Protože ty peníze mi fakt už nic neříkají. Mě nemotivují. Je to kontinuální a brutální kampaně proti mému osobě. Je to kampaně přece, ne? Takhle. Je to jenom součástí těch stejných kampaně. Já vám chci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. Tak si to všichni zapamatují. Nikdy. Tak samozřejmě to je plánovaná kampaně. Zvěděl Zvěděl. Já vám nechci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. Nech si to všichni zapamatují. Nikdy. Pokračování ty kampaně proti, proti mě, kontinuální kampaně. To by myslel všechno tu kampaně. A pana Zema, nechci ubezpečit, že já nejsem politik, nikdy nebudu politik, nikdy, vy jste generální retor, všichni mluvíte fantasticky. A já vás spíš jako něco dělám za sebou, něco za mnou jako zůstane. A lidi jsou rozumí a pochopí, že skutečně je to kampaň. Proč bych vám měl vás dělovat všechny moje příjmy? Sorry, jako. Vyzdělujete někomu příjmy? Nebo kdo to vyzděluje příjmy za 8, 22 let? Co máme vůbec za toho roku? Brutální kampaň. Je to podobné roky po kampaň, já to odmítám. Nakoupil dluhopisy mojí firmy Agrofertu za miliardu 482 milionů 269 996 korun. Celá tato kampaň. Byla kampaň. Protože já skutečně peníze nepočítám. Jako teďka jsem zjistil, jaké jsme měli příjmy. To byla mluvá má kampaň, přesně načasovaná. To prostě je tohle kampaň. Komu? Můžete mě i zdopit, ale nebudu rezignovat. A neodejdu z politiky. Takovou radost nám neudělám. Budu bojovat proti tyhle kruční hydre celý život. Celý život. Zdělání. Kolik má promile vožrala kalousek dneska? Pokračuje v tyhle nechutný kampaně. Já začali na mě házet láhové. Vaši demonstranti. Kampaň, přestaňte s tou kampaní. Mně jste vás i terorizovali za to. Samozřejmě, organizovanou kampaň. Až to vyšlo v tyhle masivní kampaň. Co jste to vydělali po ty revoluci? Tady se vedou na mě kampaň. Ale já jsem ten soud vyhrál, jsem byl korupce. Sorry, jako, ale ne. Pohoda. Čau, lidi. Je to kampaň. Co jsem znovu mluvil? A ty čeli mají rádi, protože můžou si kecat novináři, co chtěli. Permanentně vlastně neprobíhá kampaň. Počal jsi kampaň, která na mě jako probíhá. Pokračovala štvalá kampaň proti mně, aby už konečně mě dostali kvalitiky. Já vám chci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. 
Nech si to všichni zapamatuje. Nikdy. Já vám chci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. Nech si to všichni zapamatuje. Nikdy. Já vám chci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. Nech si to všichni zapamatuje. Nikdy. Pokračování ty kampaně neplatí proti mě, ale to kontinuální kampaň. To vymyslel všechno tu kampaň. A pana Zemana chci ubezpečit, že já nejsem politik, nikdy nebudu politik. Nikdy, vy jste geniální retor, všichni mluvíte fantasticky, ale já spíš jako něco dělám za sebou, něco za mnou, jako zůstane. A lidi jsou rozumní a pochopí, že skutečně je to kampaň. Proč bych vám já u nás dělala všechny moje příjmy? Co je jako? Vyzdělujete někomu příjmy, nebo kdo tady byl lepší, než za 8.22, nebo za toho, jako brutální kampaň, je to podobné, je to kampaň, a to odmítám. Nakoupil dluhopisy, moji firmy za Agrofertu, za nejádu 482 milionů, 269 996 korun. Celá tato kampaň, která kampaň. Protože já zkrátka peníze nepočítám, jako teďka já jsem zjistil, jaké jsem měl příjmy. Programovaná kampaň, slušně načasovaná, to prostě je to dle kampaň, komu? Můžete mě i zapít, ale nebudu rezignovat. A neodejdu z politiky. Takovou radost nám neudělala. Budu bojovat proti tyhle kročný hydro celé život. Celé život. Je to kampaně. No, to už je to kampaně. A to než je to skandální. Víte, proč počítám peníze? Protože ty peníze mi fakt už nic neříkají, mě nemotivují. Je to a brutální kampaň proti mé osobě. Je to kampaň přece ne, taková. Je to jenom součástí systémy kampaně. Já vám chci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. Nech si to všichni zapamatuje. Nikdy. Tak samozřejmě to je to plánovaná kampaně. Pane, Sorry, jako, ale pohoda. Čau, lidi. Je to kampaň, se nezavolou ti dole. A ty šeli mají rádi, že můžou si kyslet novináři, co chtějí. Permanentně vlastně probíhá kampaň. Učila jsi kampaň, která nám jako probíhá. Pokračovala štvalová kampaň proti mě, nevím, aby už konečně mě dostali politiky. Já vám chci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. Nech si to všichni zapamatují. Nikdy. Já vám chci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. Nech si to všichni zapamatují. Nikdy. Já vám nechci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. Nech si to všichni zapamatují. Nikdy. Pokračování ty kampaně neproti mě, proti mě, nebo kontinuální kampaň. To by nechal všechno, tu kampaň. A pana Zeman, chci ubezpečit, že já nejsem politik, nikdy nebudu politik, nikdy vy jste geniální retor, všichni mluvíte fantasticky. A já spíš jako něco dělám za sebou, něco za mnou, jako zůstane. Když se rozumí a pochopí, že skutečně je to kampaň, proč by mám já mohla sdělovat všechny moje příjmy? Sorry, jako. Brutální kampaň, je to podvod, je to kampaň, já to odmítám. Nakoupil dluhopisy, moje firmy Agrofertu, za 1.482.269.996 korun. Celá tato kampaň, protože já zkrátka peníze nepočítám, jako a teďka jsem zjistil, jaké se měl příjmy. Programovaná kampaň, přesně načasovaná, to prostě je tohle kampaň, komu? Můžete mě i zapít, ale nebudu rezignovat. A neodejdu z politiky. Takovou radost vám neudělám. Budu bojovat proti těch lek proč nic ve celé život. Celé život. Je to proč nepočítám peníze, protože ty peníze mi fakt už nic neříkají, jen nemotivují. Je to kontinuální a brutální kampaň proti mnoho osobě. Je to jenom součástí těch stejných kampaně. Já vám chci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. Nech si to všichni zapamatují. Nikdy. Tak samozřejmě to je plánovaná kampaň. Zdravíš, Sorry, I call, but... Pohoda. Ciao, Izzy. It's a campaign. It's a little bit more. 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 It's a
permanentne vlastne probíhala kampaň počas tej kampane, ktorá nám ju ako probíha. Pokračovala vaša trvalá kampaň proti mne, aby už konečne mne dostali politiky. Ja vám chcem povedať, že nikdy neodstúpi. Nikdy. Nech si to všetci zapamätajú. Nikdy. Ja vám chcem povedať, že nikdy neodstúpi. Nikdy. Nech si to všetci zapamätajú. Nikdy. Ja vám chcem povedať, že nikdy neodstúpi. Nikdy. Nech si to všetci zapamätajú. Nikdy. Pokračování kampaně proti, proti mě, nebo kontinuální kampaně, to vymyslel všechno tu kampaně. A pana Zemana chci ubezpečit, že já nejsem politik, nikdy nebudu politik, nikdy jste generální rekar, všechny umluví, že fantasticky, ale já spíš jako o, něco dělám za sebou, něco za mnou jako zůstane. Ale když jsou rodiny a pochopí, že skutečně je to kampaně, proč by máme já na rozdělovat všechny moje příjmy, sorry, jako. Vy zdravujete někomu příjmy, nebo kdo tady zdravuje příjmy, já o tom za sedu, ale třeba mi vůbec za toho jako. Brutální kampaň, je to podvěrk, je to kampaň, já to odmítám. No jako opět dluhopisy, mojí firmy, ale Grofertu, za miliardu 482 milionů 269 tisíc 296 korun. Já tato kampaň, tohle kampaň, to zvědá skutečně peníze, nepočítám, taková teďka jsem zjistil, jaké jsou jeho příjmy. Programovaná kampaň, přesně načaslovaná, to prostě je podle kampaň, komu? Můžete mě i zabít, ale nebudu rezignovat. A neodejdu z politiky. Takovou radost vám neudělá. Budu bojovat tady tyhle ruční hydry celé živu. Celé živu. Počkej mě kampaně. No, že to je 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 to to je to to Zabíšel, Zdravíte. Nech si to všichni zapamatuju. Nikdy. Já vám nechci říct, že nikdy neodstoupím. Nikdy. Nech si to všichni zapamatuju. Nikdy. Pokračovala mě ty kampaně proti, proti mě, nebo kontinuální kampaň, to vymyslel všechno tu kampaně. A pana Zemana chci ubezpečit, že já nejsem politik, nikdy nebudu politik. Nikdy vy jste geniální rétor, všichni umluví, že fantasticky. Ale já spíš už jako něco dělám za sebou, něco za mnou jako zůstane.
I apologize. No problem, no problem at all. So, hi, nice to see you, and hi, nice to have you with us today. You are Thank our you. last speaker today, and um, um, it's great to have also somebody from uh, Columbia College. Uh, last year, we had uh, Ross with us here in, uh, in Pilsen. It was a great experience. Uh, we also had an uh, opportunity to visit, uh, well, it was the, basically the last chance to travel from Europe to the United States when we in February last year visited, um, or, or this year actually, uh, uh, Columbia College. We've seen uh, some of your students. We spoke about cooperation, um, which uh, didn't work out uh, this year because, uh, because of uh, evident reasons. Uh, but I'm very glad that uh, we can meet uh, at least in this way and uh, very warm wel welcome to you we are, as, uh, to uh, describe the situation for you. We are here with, uh, together with uh, a couple of students because we have like limit uh, 20 persons per uh, uh, room, so these are limitations. Uh, there are uh, uh, there are a number of people following us online, so that is our audience, and I give now the microphone to Jan, uh, who will do a brief on introduction uh, to your work. Hi, Jay. Mm, our last guest of today's symposium is Jay Walker. Jay is based in Chicago, but at this moment you are in Georgia, I believe. I am. I'm in yes. Atlanta, Georgia. Yeah. in Atlanta. Uh, Jay is currently a professor of photography at Columbia College, where he also served as chair of the art and design department. His photography can be found in the collection of, collections of MoMA, Whitney Museum of American Arts, the Art Institute of Chicago, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the St. Louis Art Museum, among many others. Exhibitions in which he participated were organized mainly in Italy and throughout the United States and of course now also in our Pilsen, Czech Republic. The works of Jay Walker that were uh, included in the exhibition Boundaries, Poetics of Conflict are part of a project that is ongoing and that are the result of a repetitive process of scanning and digitally distorting physical edges to the point of abstraction. Jay, after we spoke on the telephone, I wrote you in an email that, uh, in my opinion, your project Edges comes out of a process of building and deconstructing, rebuilding, and eventually sort of uh, freezing the image when it appears most fragile, most tense, most on edge, which provokes a certain uh, rejection of any form of uh, security. If you can agree with this observation, then uh, now it is a good time to share with us your art and uh, photography projects. If you, if you don't agree with this observation, then it's also a good time to start with your uh, you know, presentation. So we are ready and listening. Thank you. Well, thank you both very much for the kind words. And yes, uh, Columbia College has been really uh, uh, happy to work with you folks, and uh, I'm very happy to be here with you. So uh, I know we're a little late, so I'll get going here. Um, so what I've done is I've put together a, um, a, a few photographs, and in fact, Jan saw them when I proposed uh, some work for the show. I'm going to show the ones that I actually um, showed to you, Jan, which has examples from three different projects, um, just to get an idea that uh, I have been essentially uh, examining the idea of borders, boundaries, buffers for my entire 40 year career. Um, and most of my work could be seen that way given the right framework. So what I'm gonna do here is uh, firstly, I'm gonna start, oh, I better, I'll share my screen. Okay, can you see that list that's up right now? Yes, we do. You see that? So I've made a list here and it's pretty extensive. There's some overlap obviously and some words that might mean similar ideas, but 
All of these are ways in which I believe you can uh, consider the idea of a boundary. Uh, we often think of boundaries as uh, being spatial, but they're also non-spatial. There are conceptual boundaries, cultural boundaries, as I say, physical, virtual, vertical, horizontal. We think of boundaries as being on a horizontal plane, but in fact, much of the world is based on vertical boundaries where air rights are actually part of the boundary system, things we cannot tangibly see. And I've spent a, a whole career dealing with this kind of idea. In fact, this list is, I, I, I was told I had to give an assignment. So just briefly, this list will be the, um, the inspiration, I hope, for students. And I've asked them to make images that address two types of these boundaries. Uh, so you can pick two of these and make images that deal with those uh, kind of factors. So that was my idea. But um, I think by reading this, you'll see that boundaries are one of the most ubiquitous and uh, flexible ideas that we can imagine. Um, so I'm going to start with some work here and show you where, where I've been. Um, hold on. Uh, okay, can I share something else here? I hope so. Do you still see, do you see these? No. Okay. Let's see if I can do this. I am going to share screen again. You see that now? Okay. Very good. So um, what we're doing, what I'm going to show you here are some images from three different periods in my photographic career. Um, the first group I'm going to show you are actually images that I made over 30 years ago in Las Vegas, Atlantic City, and Reno, Nevada. And at that time in the late 80s, these places were the only places you could go to gamble in the United States. This is where gambling was legal. And at the time, I was looking for places where people go to have a temporary change of of um, emotional state, of private emotions in a public venue. And these cities are, were designed for that kind of temporary transformative psychological state. People go there essentially to cross the boundaries of their own individuality. They will move into other spaces and ideas and proximities um, based on their need and their desire. So I went to these cities looking not just at people that gamble, but how the cities are organized physically and psychologically in order to facilitate a certain kind of boundary crossing. So I'll show you a few of these images uh, and, and, and you can see in each one of the ones I've shown, there is some demarcation, some kind of a boundary. So obviously here's a man going to the edge of his property to receive his mail. Uh, here's a man who decided this was the correct space to have a suntan. And again, the idea of what constitutes normalcy and how we cross over or accept that normalcy is part of our consideration as human beings. And so again, this is a boundary I believe that's been crossed and that's in terms of comfortability. Here are two people playing golf right next to an airport. So again, very fuzzy, very gray borders. A man on the boardwalk at Atlantic City. And of course, there are uh, symbolic boundaries. Here, we know that in Atlantic City, you'll see a couple of others where there is economic separation between people. And so the idea of these cities where there are these huge statues and advertising and artifacts and architecture that symbolize wealth and the uh, winning of wealth. In fact, the reality is people don't get that wealth. And there is a huge disparate population of poverty and people who go there and are not connected to the dreams that these places have. And in fact, the name of this book, which I published this work just a couple of years ago, uh, even though it was made many years ago, Carer Verlag just published this book a couple of years ago, and it's called Same Dream Another Time. Here's another Atlantic City shot. 
Here's a man in his, his trailer, again, looking out beyond the borders of his home. I mentioned one of the boundaries and borders as being safety. And this one really challenges this notion of what is a safe border and what is not a safe border and how we choose to either be afraid or not. In this case, this family decided it was just fine to rest on a median strip in a very busy street in Las Vegas. And then we see this picture, which absolutely crosses over sexual boundaries, cultural and social boundaries. And here is a fight in the middle of a street in Las Vegas. Um, and again, this one breaches emotional and um, psychological boundaries. Here's another boundary, that man in the car, he's dead now, but he used to be a famous American singer. And here we see him in his automobile and the fans surround him. And the only thing separating these two worlds is that glass between him and the crowd. And so again, this also deals with a kind of separation and isolation of the figure within the larger populace. This woman on the left was a candidate for Miss America, the famous beauty pageant that takes place in Atlantic City. And here you can see her signing an autograph for a young girl who's with her mother on the right. And the boundary obviously is clear. There is a separation between the celebrity and even the artifice of what this person on the left looks like, this woman, and the kind of normalcy or plainness of these people on the right. And of course, the great irony is the mother has brought her child to learn how to become the beauty queen. That's why some women bring their children, so they learn how to be beauty contestants. But I have to say, if you look closely, I believe the young girl will probably end up growing up more like her mother than the beauty queen. So that's the irony of this one. And here again, this is Miss America on a float. So this is, she's being paraded through the streets of Atlantic City. And again, we see the boundaries between cultural, commercial, uh, sexual, uh, power and economic structures. All of that is in this photo. And here's another similar one. The man up in the uh, banner up there is a very famous prize fighter. And this was one of the most famous fights that happened in 1988 in Las Vegas. And again, we see the populace and all the fans. Uh, they still want to go to the event, but they're not going to go to the event. All they can do is stand outside the hotel where the event is taking place. So the symbol of the man in the banner is uh, symbolic of them crossing over the boundary and being in the space. But of course, they can't be there. Here's another boundary between a, a man who is obviously not in the limousine with all the crushed velvet, but is uh, gawking at it. And then finally, this is a man getting off a bus in Atlantic City, and you can see the layering of all of the symbols that represent different types of states um, that this person hopes to be able to conquer during his trip in Atlantic City. So those are those photographs, and they basically discuss more of the emotional and psychological boundaries. The next body of work, which I am now working on, in fact, I'm here in Atlanta shooting more photographs, and it's, um, it, it has a very, uh, a very boring title at the moment. I'm, I'm, I'm working through my list of titles, but right now the working title of this is called Building Place. And of course, place has a great deal to do with things like boundaries. Um, and even something as tentative or as temporal as this little rope signifies a boundary. So these photographs are done with four by five and they're all landscape architecture. Some include some figures in it, but they are really meant not to include the figure as the primary motivator of the image or the driver of the image, but rather concentrating on artifact, architecture, and especially how nature is affected by man-made incursions. And a lot of this has to do with the earmarks and artifice of how place is defined. And here we 
see these, these definitions as clear boundaries in the landscape. So I'll just go through some of these. Now these photographs actually I've been shooting uh, this particular project, which I'm hoping to have a book next year on this. Um, I've been doing these for over 12, 15 years now. Um, so many of these come from Italy, some from the United States, all over the United States. Some are from Israel, uh, some are from uh, France. So they come from all over and uh, I've been traveling all over. And luckily it's a kind of project where you can see there are kind of universal qualities of what boundaries and borders and place are. And you can find different manifestations of them all over the world. I don't have images of this project with me today, but one of my uh, first projects, which was a five-year uh, photographic uh, documentary of the most busy and dangerous expressway or highway in the United States called the Dan Ryan Expressway, and it's called Along the Divide. And in fact, that was all about how a road becomes a linear boundary one that separates rich people out in the suburbs and poor people in the city. And these roads were designed in order to bring more affluent people away from the city and essentially separate them from the city and still allow them to come in to work. So the reason I say that now is because you're looking at some, this is uh, down in Calabria in Italy, and here is a, an abandoned tunnel. So obviously somebody had the same idea of uh, trying to create a boundary or a border that could get them out of this space, but it was abandoned. So I guess they're still there. This is a 2000 year old Roman mausoleum. Uh, and it was, it's a ruin along the Via Appia in Rome. And here we see uh, actually a blue mattress, which is being used by a prostitute. And uh, that person is taking uh, clients all day long into this 2000 year old mausoleum. Um, and again, if I, 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 the idea of even historical boundaries come into play. Here's another set of, um, of contrasts that deal with history. On the right is a World War II um, lookout tower during the war, and it still has its barbed wire around it and everything. And right across the street is a multi-million dollar villa. So again, the idea of historical and physical boundaries coming together. This is sort of a funny one. This one is in uh, Trieste, up in the northeast of Italy. And here is a family who has their home, and in this case, a little playhouse for their grandchildren. And they're right next to the highway and the factory. And here, again, we see this, this pushing together of various artifacts that creates this tension between boundaries. That's part of this project. This is a very recent one I did uh, just a few weeks ago uh, in um, Sin uh, where was this? Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And we see, uh, you can tell there's people camping under a, a viaduct, a bridge here, and all of these other states of the city uh, unfolding behind it. This is in Israel. This is a little exercise area, a very strange little place. Uh, where I guess people go to exercise, but it, it, it's got a very uh, tentative border or wall here. This is just your average fiat inside of an apartment building. And this is a public area in public housing in Trieste, which I found to be almost frightening in terms of its expectations of activity and its inclusion within this public space uh, or in this uh, uh, public housing to create the suggestion of a public space. But obviously there are uh, some tensions going on here. This is in Miami, Florida. 
This is an old, some kind of a plaza or piazza in Naples, which was abandoned many years ago. But again, the idea of how lines and walls and color and shapes absolutely create space and separations. This is a pop-up space in Chicago, actually. So you're, the foreground is very temporary and the background is very permanent. This is a motocross course in uh, Slovenia, actually. And uh, again, we see the separation of activities defined by zoning and um, uh, architectural uh, landscape planning. And then finally, this is a little workshop that's below the mountaintop in the Carrara marble mines. And again, we see this very strange uh, incursion of highly personal symbolism and activity within a very natural and industrial space. So you've got a very broad and diverse set of activities here. So those are the ones which we might call representational. And I will finish with a few of the images and I wanna thank you very much folks for including this work in the exhibition. Um, these are things that I've been playing with for oh, about six, seven years now. And these are called edges and they are edges, actual edges, but they are recorded by using a handheld surface scanner. So it has no depth of field, but very high resolution and is able to capture surface uh, textures and, and objects and uh, 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 landscapes on the wall or on any surface actually. And so I started playing around with just recording the edges of surfaces. And so what that means is that you're going to end up having a very hard edge uh, or a hard focus where the edge is and then off the edge, you're going to start to lose definition and focus. And you mentioned earlier this idea of, uh, of tension in these pieces. And these pieces are all about cognition. In fact, these borders, these boundaries have as much to do with perceptual boundaries as they do the physical ones that they are recording. And by using this instrument, I'm able to create what I consider a first person kind of narrative, as though you are the scanner or you are literally sitting on the surface of these materials and, and you are on the edge. And that's how these are created and what they're intended to be uh, projected at. So you can see I'm moving from the very literal and documentary into the much more poetic and abstract. But in my mind, they still explore similar ideas. These are also made over time. So what you're seeing here is actually the recording over about a 45 second period. So say I start from the left here, I actually decide how I am going to choreograph my recordings or my surface scans over the 45 seconds that I have to make those scans. So I can actually decide or what I call it a score, like a musical score, that I will actually record certain things in time or over time to create this long linear temporal document of that recording. So this is also similar to um, a musical performance or a dance performance. There is a temporal concept to this work. That's a double edge, by the way. One, the recorder is able to pick up two edges at once because these are the two high surfaces that I'm recording.
So those are the images that I wanted to share with you. It covers a very long period from about 1987 to now, but, um, and there's been a few other photographs I've made since then, but these, these I think are most appropriate for this discussion. So thank you. If you want to ask any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, uh, this is uh, indeed again uh, a good moment to welcome questions. Um, uh, Jay, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for uh, uh, introducing us to your work. Um, uh, very much fascinated, as I already, uh, I think, uh, mentioned on the telephone when we spoke uh, about uh, your works, um, um, looking into the gambling uh, uh, Las Vegas, Atlantic City, uh, I believe Nevada also. Um, and and what I very much like about it is that it's it's you know like uh, the, well basically uh, uh, Las Vegas is a, is a completely artificial uh, place. Um, it's all about performance show, sort of blinding. It should go fast. It's about uh, uh, sensation, sensations, um, and uh, it sort of only creates a superficiality. Like it's all staged. It's all placed into a decor. Uh, there's actually nothing unique and it sort of dissolves into that uh, sort of um, um, uh, repetitiveness. Um, and then you continue to, to show, uh, you, you know, like the other works that you also made in, in, uh, in Italy. And um, it sort of reminded me of the, the work of uh, Charlotte, Charlotte Liber. We invited her uh, two years ago. And uh, she, she was, she is very interested in sort of like the the artificiality of living in a gated community, and she did a photo uh, project actually in um, uh, Florida, the Sunshine State, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, people living uh, in a sort of like a utopian kind of uh, uh, environment, uh, enjoying their their old uh, age, of course, um, and. Um, it's interesting to to see how in uh, in many of the the images that you showed you show you sort of um, create um, or you sort of emphasize this um, decor even if like you know it's just, let's say a photo of somewhere in in the south of Italy uh, as you say like it's a place where people uh, would come together. Uh, communal space, and then you photograph it in such a way that it actually becomes a stage on which coming together is performed, which I find uh, very interesting, actually. Can you say something a bit more about uh, this subject? Well, it's interesting you said that, in fact, I do make photographs of the stage upon which a performance would be made, because I, I like to say I don't shoot nouns, I shoot verbs, and, and, and I really mean that. When I make a photograph, I am looking for a set of interactions and factors that are all dependent on one another. So it's not really the object that I'm shooting, but the actual effects that made that object or the intention of the object. And therefore, my photographs tend to be a little more complicated because I'm forcing you to make those relationships happen rather than photographing a thing, which, I mean, I, I think there are beautiful nouns, don't get me wrong. But I am very interested in that kind of a temporal uh, aspect to the work uh, and, and a uh, conversational aspect to the work as opposed to an artifactual one. And so these places, like you said, uh, a place like Las Vegas, which is completely artificial and is made up of artifact, um, is actually a stand-in for a series of activities rather than a standalone uh, phenomenon in itself. Obviously, those things are meant as stages. They are stages. Um, in fact, uh, Robert Venturi, a very famous American architect in the 60s, wrote a very famous book, and it was called Learning from Las Vegas. It was written around 1966, and it is probably the Bible, the original gospel of postmodern architecture. And his concept was that Las Vegas is essentially a series of covered sheds. These are boxes that are covered with a message. And so the idea that architecture itself is no longer specific to an activity, but rather it's purely structure 
and we overlay or lay on top of the architecture the language that the participants are essentially intended to participate in. And that, to me, was a fascinating idea that's written all over Las Vegas, and I think it has also informed a lot of my other documentary work as well. Yes, these are absolutely stages upon which um, actions and events will or have taken place. Um. I'm, I'm maybe hook up on that a little bit because it was, uh, to me also, it's uh, the, uh, let's say the term stage uh, uh, like blinked and, and, and uh, but it was for me, it's also like, like with the, within the structure of your photography, uh, like you have these, uh, these layers and uh, sometimes it's almost like the, uh, the first layer um, acts like the actors on stage, so it's it's uh, it's not like a prepared stage for actors, but actually the uh, the, the stage itself becomes uh, the acting part within the larger setting of the other layers of the photography. So it's it's really very fascinating. I, lo I love those um, uh, those images. So it was my, just a reflection on the on the on the aspect of uh, kind of stage. Uh, I was w wondering also about the thing like. Um, <clears throat> because we are now uh, talking about the topic boundaries. And uh, of course, these images are um, very, um, uh, very uh, applicable on that. But uh, did you, I don't think you made these uh, pictures or these images specifically uh, on the theme of boundaries, because you are focusing on other um, themes or, or uh, other, is it, is it right? Yes, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, I didn't, I'm, although I will say this new project was originally called The Box. And in fact, um, at, it's a funny thing. There's two ways you can make a photographic project. You can either have a concept that you are completely committed to and you go out and make photographs based on that concept, or you can go out and make photographs and then look at them and say, what is behind these photographs? What is it that I've actually shown? And you start to see a theme emerge from the work, which is a lot of what happened with these new landscape photographs. And it was funny because last year I said, well, these are really all about boxes. These are about contained spaces. This is about how people define um, and determine where my space begins and ends. And that also is public, but it's also private. And so you're right that yes, I do go and shoot um, other themes originally. But what I have found is that this idea of borders and boundaries is endemic to my thinking in general. And so I can see throughout all of my career that these projects, while they might have been about a highway, in fact, as I said, that highway in and of, of itself is a boundary. And it was, the, the title of the project is called Along the Divide. So it was about that separation. Um, my um, Italian book from 2011 called Architecture of Resignation. Yes, that project is about dysfunctional and exploitive architecture in the south of Italy. There's no doubt about that. But the idea of how it functions is absolutely a separation between people and cultures and governments and power structure. So while you're right, I don't specifically look for boundaries. Boundaries become, in a sense, the glue or the vehicle by which a lot of the things I photograph are actually defined. And so that's why I think the work applies to this, to this theme here. Yeah. <laughs> And I also quickly want to I want to uh, go uh, back to to your work edges that is in the exhibition. Um, uh, you know, when, when I was looking at your uh, website some some weeks ago, uh, I think I told you also like I was um, very interested in the works of uh, uh, the south of Italy. At the same time, I was very much uh, almost distracted by the works called first person misdemeanor. Can you say yeah. something about this? Because it's not completely the same as the works edges. Not at all. Not at well, all. Well, sure. Um, 
Let me start by saying that I started off as a painter originally and a sculptor and a performance artist. Um, I became a photographer because I felt that my little imagination could never be as rich as the world is. And that in fact, there is a depth of history and intention and artifact that the world provides that no single human being can really ever manufacture. And that's one fascination I think photographers have. Um, wait, ask your question again, I'm sorry. I'll get there again. What was your question again? Uh, I said that when I looked at your website, I was very much distracted by the works ah. uh, presented in first-person misdemeanor. First-person misdemeanor. So, what I was trying to say is that, in my mind, all of photography is appropriation. All of photography is a collage. We are looking for visual ways to put the world together into a two-dimensional frame. Um, you mentioned before this idea of layering of space. And in fact, um, I'm very much a visualist. I, I love making two-dimensional space. And that, of course, is an oxymoron. That's a paradox. You don't have real space. So all we have are the visual properties of color, line, perspective, focus, and light to really explore this idea of layering of space. And therefore, that layering becomes the narrative. That We only have space as the narrative in two-dimensional photography. So in my mind, the way that those things distribute around the frame is very much a narrative process. That is the way I write my stories. So as you said, things in the foreground become important as figures, but I really believe foreground, middle ground, and background are in tandem. They dance together to create that idea. So first-person misdemeanor is really, that's sort of a weird subject, a weird title, but I've been playing around with these little wand scanners forever. And um, what, I, what I found is that it is an amazingly unique way of recording the world. It's a very simple thing. It's just a, a, it's a, essentially like a flatbed scanner only you can take it around with you all over the world. So it's a wonderful portable object. The, the misdemeanor pictures come in many forms. I have hundreds of texts, for example. This summer when I was photographing all over uh, the United States, uh, uh, I would bring my scanner with me and of course there were a lot of um, protests uh, all over the United States this summer. And many of the public spaces in cities all over the country had huge uh, graffiti and, and writing and pictures and words and slogans. So it was a great opportunity just to document those. And the scanner is a perfect way to do it. I could literally, uh, as long as it was under 8.533 inches, which is the height of it, I could actually make a document of that text as it once goes across the wall. And I've got hundreds of those. I have others, as I said, that I would go, for example, to a place and make a portrait of the place by examining those artifacts that are on the walls or the floor around me and deciding, as I said earlier, I create a score. So I say, I'm gonna go from here to here to here and I'm going to do a certain amount of time for each one of those areas. And what ends up to be is essentially a linear collage, uh, a, a, a kind of musical score, or a filmic kind of progression or sequence of symbols. So that's another way that I make these pictures. And, and again, it's a very different way than looking at a still spatially made photograph uh, with, a, with a traditional camera. Um, I have others in this project where I've literally taken, well, I, I've made 10,000 of these things. So I have essentially source materials from all over the world, textures, patterns, lines, advertisements, pictures, everything you can imagine that one could scan, I have in my, re in my archive now. And what I can do now is I can remove that documentary sense now. And I also will literally take out certain elements from say a hundred different scans and I'll use those as collage elements now. And now I guess I think I'm, I'm smart enough to make my own art again. So I take those things and I put them together to create an entirely new space or an entirely new 
symbol or subject that nobody's ever seen before. So this is an, it's like a, it's a new medium that I'm playing with here. And it allows me to cross over many visual and conceptual boundaries. So the edges is in a sense, the most pure example of this, where literally all I do is just scan the edge and that's it. I, I play a little bit in post, but for the most part, those are straight, what I would call a straight scan. But from there, I have the ability to mix and match and create any kind of image I want. And they all come out in a very peculiar way. So you're welcome to go to my website. They're a little old, but there's a bunch of new ones or things done, I think, until last year. So there's, there's a lot of material from that. I don't know if that answers your question, but it yeah, Yes, yes, yes. Any more questions? Um, Maybe we have just, uh, 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 there's one more question. Um, I find it really interesting also that you have like these two components in, in your work, like this uh, uh, absolutely controlled photography, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with a with large format camera, uh, uh, controlling the architecture, the, 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 the every line, so it's a, a real, also uh, I admire the professional uh, approach, it's beautiful. Uh, and, and you have this, this, this freedom uh, working with the scans and, uh, and uh, relying on, uh, on uh, well, what will happen because uh, it's not, not really in your hands, uh, not, not, not perfectly in your hands, so it's, a, it's quite the opposite thing. And, yes. and it's also interesting how you, uh, yeah, how you see uh, this material, that it's uh, maybe not definite, but it is also like a material for, for next uh, pieces of art. So I think it's also very inspirational for a lot of our students how to, that all these kind of uh, working methods uh, can be combined in one uh, artistic <laughs> personality. So thank you, thank you for, for sharing that with us. My pleasure, my pleasure. Yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, a, a typically confused artist, and um, thankfully I, I have not been famous, so famous that I've been demanded, it's been demanded of me to make one kind of photograph my whole career. And that's one of the unfortunate parts of people who get very well known for something. Um, and even if I were, it would not stop me. I've been changing my approach since the day I started making anything visual. And in fact, if there was anything that defined me, it's don't make me do that again. You know, I constantly tell myself, show me something I don't know. That's what I say to myself on every trip. I mean, I've made thousands and thousands of visual images. But each time I have to ask myself, what is it here that I have not seen before? And so the wand scanner start, I'll tell you how that all started because it, um, you know, I, I'm one of the last students of the Institute of Design at IIT, the new Bauhaus. And in fact, I was the last head of photography there before they closed that in 1999. And so I come out of the Maholi tradition of experimental photography, of light, of space, of shadow, of making things that do have definitions of their own. In fact, when I was studying at the ID, the word art was a dirty word because the idea was that photography has its own aesthetic, it has its own motivation, its own recording method, and that it is not the same as the other plastic arts. I'm not sure I agree with all of that, but the truth is by looking at it that way, you start to examine photography as a vehicle by which one can explore many different uh, avenues of your own creativity and of your own observations. So I have not let medium become uh, an impediment to experimentation. Um, I've made, the, the, the Las Vegas pictures were made with a six by seven. I did a project after that, which was six nine and six seven. I've, used a panoramic camera, an X-Pan, uh, four by five forever. Uh, and now this other thing. And what I was saying was before I started making what I called scanograms instead of photograms, which was a typical 20th century silver based activity, obviously. And I started with those many years ago and taught them when we still taught dark room. That was the first thing you go into the dark room and you make a, a photograph without a camera and you understand that this material is sensitive and will record uh, the shadow or highlight of that object. 
So in 2013, when uh, I got rid of my color dark room, actually, uh, I started playing around with a flatbed scanner the way one might think of a photogram. So you become the glass, you look up. And I defeated the, the uh, depth of field issue and the light issue by pouring tons of light above the scanner. And I was able to build up things over three feet high on top of a, a flatbed scanner. So I was creating all these abstract, essentially photograms in my mind, but they were made with a scanner. And after a while I said, I gotta get out of here. I can't do all this in the studio. How can I bring this thing outside and play with the world? And I started by doing it with like a cheap flatbed, like a cheap, uh, um, what do you call it? A laptop computer and a cheap uh, a scanner that I could take around with me, but that did not work. <laughs> that with uh, carrying a, flat, a, a, a MacBook uh, and, and a flatbed scanner around on my back and trying to make scans in Istanbul was not going to work. Whereas this little wand scanner was the perfect way to take that idea outside. I can't do the same things, but like any material, you learn its dynamics and you play with it. I just want to say one last thing, and that is the idea of accident. Um, you know, when we look at the real world, what we're seeing is a confluence of many accidents anyway. Um, but I don't have control over those accidents. I have to take advantage of my objectivity of my outsiderness to look at those accidents that the world provides. The scanner, in a way, I am creating the accident. So it's a matter of agency, and I'm just willing to switch that agent from the world to me. And maybe it's a little more of a collaboration between me and the world and the scanner. So that's what that instrument does. As this little scanner, by the way, is meant for grandmothers to scan their grandchildren's pictures. It is not meant to do the things I've done. And I've destroyed many, many of these scanners because I, I roll them across surfaces that one should never roll across. So they have inevitably become filled with grit and stones and crap. And I have to throw it out and buy another one. But luckily, they're pretty cheap. So um, it's just been a lot of fun, the way to change it up a little bit. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I think we have to uh, move to the the, the, the discussion, uh, the last part of the uh, uh, because we we are out of time with this Zoom, I believe. Huh? Yeah, we will be back with you in a couple of minutes, if that's okay. Thank you so Thank much, you Jay. Much. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for uh, for inviting me. Thank you. I'll see you soon. Hi, Jay. Uh, we are back, and you as well, I guess. Um, I'm here, yes. 
Yes, okay. Um, we are waiting for the other participants, uh, if they will uh, log in as well. Um, but maybe we have now a little bit of time for you to um, present the assignment you have for our students. Oh, sure. Yes? I'd be happy to. Okay, and I thank can you. attach this and put it in the, uh, I guess I can put it in the chat. Hold on one second. Ah, yes. Hold on one second. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attach this right now. All right. So in the chat, I have just put uh, that list of factors that I talked about. Um, hold on. I'll just share it again for you. So, as I said earlier, these were all factors of possible boundary-driven ideas um, that I wrote out. And you might have to look at a few, uh, look up some of these definitions, but I know they're pretty, they're pretty common. So there's probably about, I don't know, 30 different kinds of borders of boundaries that I could think of. And by the way, I'm not gonna say you can't think of any as well. Maybe you'll wanna have some of your own. So I know you're getting assignments from a lot of other people. So in this, you see at the bottom, make images that address two of these type of boundaries. So you can take any two of these qualities and make some images for comparison to see how you might handle these different considerations. Does that work for you? That sounds fine. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Hi, Hinek. How are you? Hey, nice to see you again. Nice to see you too. Did you follow us the whole day? Or did you take I, a... I did. Uh, I, had, I had some breaks. I, <laughs> I had to, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did see most of it, at least uh, bits. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Thank you so much. Um, it would be maybe a nice uh, moment to uh, welcome questions, but um, uh, I'm, I'm still very much interested in, in uh, learning a bit more uh, um, about your ideas, um, like how do you sort of see uh, the concept of boundary boundaries in your artistic practice, in your uh, research. And uh, it's actually interesting to have uh, both of you here on our screen. Um, we just um, had our um, uh, discussion with uh, with Jay. In uh, well, there's you know the sort of uh, on the one hand there's the photography that uh, sort of focuses on the artificial stage of a city like Las Vegas, uh, and and uh, sort of uh, much more direct, almost physical. Uh, contact uh, with uh, the scanning uh, of surfaces uh, in the, the work of edges. And then in your work, Hinek, we, we have a, a whole new of, uh, let's say, uh, complexity that uh, introduces mm. us to the idea of um, uh, image recuperation, uh, actually also sort of like appropriation because you uh, buy images from uh, Getty uh, and uh, print them in, in a, a specific, let's say, an edition, and then they sort of disappear uh, um, uh, into the world, and you don't have any control over this. Um, mm -hmm. And I, what I really also find fascinating about your work, Hinek, is this, uh, you know, the, 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 the puppets uh, that you introduced, like uh, sort of this transformation uh, and, and almost like an identification with uh, a, a fictional mm -hmm. character. Um, so I guess the question is um, to, you know, maybe explain something uh, about this idea of boundaries in the context of your own art practice. Maybe Hinek, you mm -hmm. want to start? Uh, hmm. I think I need to think about it. I, I would, um, yes, I would uh, say something extremely intuitive right now, uh, something about framing and photography, but I think it would be, uh, so um, can I, do I have a minute to think about it? Yes, yes, yes. 
So Jay, what about you? Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I pretty much said most of what I was thinking <laughs> a few moments ago. But um, I'll, say, I'll say it again. I think in most of my career, the idea of boundaries has been under the surface of every idea that I've ever worked on. Um, because I think the world is basically made up of boundaries. That is the man-made or human-made condition. Um, as much as we might think that there is a complete public venue, I don't think there is. We always carry with us the private, even when we're in public. So I, I think it's a fascinating thing to explore. And because it's so ubiquitous and universal, this idea of separation between states or beings or individuals, um, it becomes, as I say, a glue that can hold together any number of themes or contexts, assuming that you're conscious of the boundary that takes place in that situation. So that's, that's basically what's driven my work for all of these years. Um, and uh, as I said earlier, it may not be the explicit theme of the work, but it is certainly one of the primary driving forces of what I have explored. Absolutely. Yeah, what I what I do want to add to this is indeed when we when we speak about boundaries, we sort of um, uh, we we always speak from a certain context. Of course, um, there's the um, we boundaries is a something that is different than another something. Um, and and in my also curated text, I talk about uh, the sort of uh, transgressing of uh, boundaries, which is actually part of the identity of of, uh, of boundaries. Um, uh, for instance, when we spoke to uh, um, uh, Rui, I believe, previously, um, no, sorry, we, we spoke with Johannes this morning, uh, and, and he focused his photography, um, he, he, for instance, went to the, the, the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, and instead of uh, photographing the paintings of Vincent van Gogh, he focused sort of on the frame the periphery of the artwork, the shadow, sort of like the non-space, um, the space around the image that everybody is attracted to. Um, and I'm very interested in sort of this, this specific uh, space between um, the one something and the other something, and, and how we constantly sort of uh, move from one to, to another. Um, he well, it's interesting that, that you know, we think of a boundary, it's fascinating you say that because in fact a boundary is always suggestive of at least two things, never one thing. And oftentimes as individuals I think we think of boundaries as only keeping us in or somehow keeping everything else out. But the truth is it's always a shared experience. A boundary is always something to be transgressed. And in fact one of the things that the edges most illustrate, and especially at such a small micro level, is that boundaries are fuzzy. They're, they're gray. They don't exist as hard edges. In fact, there's always something that we might call liminal or outside of the thing that also defines the thing. It's sort of typical of, of, um, of visual art as well. You know, are we looking at an object or are we looking at the space around that object? So the positive negative, you know, paradox becomes absolutely defined in a study of boundaries. That's what it's all about. What is positive space? What is negative space? And is there a difference? How do we use those terms, um, both psychologically and physically? Yeah, I think this is uh, super interesting. I um, actually figured what the what the trigger was for me, and I think. Um, uh, uh, Jan uh, just mentioned it um, uh, in a sense that if if I think how the subject of boundaries um, appears in my work, then I think it's uh, through the surface as some sort of membrane between. Um, so it, it is exactly this uh, um, tiny um, um, edge of something. So the image, theoretically, the image is. Uh, has no third dimension. Um, it's a it's completely flat plane, and I um, 
I feel like in all of my works, I, I'm, I'm trying to work or question this idea of the surface, something that is in front, something that is behind, and something that carries this, um, this super thin um, idea. Does that make sense? Yeah, def definitely, definitely. Um, I, I don't have, uh, I think I have no question at the moment, but I, I was uh, really thinking about uh, today's uh, uh, symposium uh, when we are talking about boundaries. I find it so fascinating uh, that um, photography seems almost to have no boundaries <laughs> because we have so many approaches uh, presented today and, and it's it's totally uh, inspirational and I, I, I have no words for it. It's, 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 uh, <laughs> it's great to have you here with, with your ideas. And, and, uh, but yes, boundaries. Um, um, we are working all uh, as, as artists with, with these boundaries within, within us and, and, and trespassing them uh, all the way. So it's, 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 an, it's, an, uh, it's a constant, uh, uh, process and um, and does it lead to a question? No, no, not at the moment. Maybe, maybe Jan has some. Um, I, I just noticed that uh, Rui is uh, joining us again. Thank you so much, Rui. Um, because w during the, the, the presentation of Jay, uh, who is in the United States and, and traveled a lot in the United States for his uh, work and for his art and photography, um, I uh, had to think about you because um, you mentioned a couple of times the, the, the sort of uh, idea of a road trip, uh, American road trip, you said specifically. And um, uh, I, uh, you know, I see it in some kind of a, let's say, a romanticized uh, idea of uh, a road trip, perhaps um, maybe stimulated by Jack Kerouac or the 50s, 60s, etc. Hollywood sort of tapping into this idea of of uh, freedom, uh, the the vast open space, etc. And then you, in your in your own work about uh, along the break, um, as I said, like it's this this super uh, unstable ground that you're walking on um, uh, throughout um, um, uh, Israel from border to border. And there's a, a lot of symbols and, and um, um, references to war and, and politics and history and, and ruins and uh, minefields. And it's, it's super, super loaded with, uh, with so many meanings. And uh, then on, on, at the same time, we have Jay, uh, who uh, photographed uh, the, 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 the atmosphere, the, you know, the the activities in Las Vegas, Atlantic City, etc., like in the in the field of gambling, and we talked about how um, uh, the whole uh, city of Las Vegas is basically a decor, like a stage. It's sort of a fake, uh, but it becomes a reality because there is um, uh, sensations happening, and they're like happening again every day, every day, every day. Um, so I sort of suddenly noticed a contrast between. Uh, the work of Rui, who talks about um, the idea of an American um, road trip um, and the sort of way that Jay introduces um, his, his way of seeing a place like Las Vegas, which is, in a, you know, like I would probably say completely artificial. So it's, it's very far away from this, this uh, romanticized idea of the vast open space and, and the romantic uh, uh, sort of um, uh, American road trip. Uh, Rui, I don't know if you uh, saw the presentation of Jay, um, but if you want to maybe expand a little bit on um, how do you see this, uh, this um, uh, sort of road trip idea. I'm very curious about this. Uh, yes. Yeah, so. First of all, I did see uh, Jay's presentation and I am almost embarrassed to say that I, I was not familiar with this uh, amazing body of work before. So I'm really glad that I am now. And there was something from the very first image that Jay shared that I immediately kind of 
strike me in the way that he compose uh, whatever it is that he's working with um, in a way that I, I could kind of really relate to that the subject matter in a way is like that's how I felt I'm not really projecting it on Jay's intention but uh, everything is extremely uh, performative in a way you mentioned it as well like a stage and the way he breaks the frame into these segments of the near, the far, and the in-between, which is something that I often do in my work, especially in the English countryside, because of that kind of interaction with a place. Uh, and I found it amazing how Jay managed to take an open space and, and the way he portrays everything that he does is very, in a way, classic, like landscape photography, or it does definitely resemble this... Uh, romanticized landscape in the way that it's built but then the way it presents itself in reality create this enormous tension that i found fascinating so thank you uh, jay for sharing and thank you jan for uh, thank you for the opportunity to be familiarized with that work um but then you're going back to the idea of the road trip and i guess even for me like the road trip is an idea that it's always meant to be a failure like it's this attempt that is always utopian in your head or your mind or your intention, but the reality of it and and the starting point of that journey is it's about to fail in its intention to achieve this utopia. And I think the more it fails in the way it presents itself, it is more successful in the tension that it creates. And I think what Jay is doing is uh, or have done um, in that work definitely achieved that. And, it's something that I uh, I find very uh, inspiring. Well, your work does the same thing, and I've been looking at your work, and uh, boy, you, you make gorgeous space. You have some wonderful work there. I'm on sabbatical right now, unfortunately. I was supposed to be in Israel shooting, uh, oh, really? but I couldn't travel, so I'm in uh, Pittsburgh instead, and right now I'm in Atlanta. But um, I love your work as well. We really have a conversation, I think, the two of us. And yeah, uh, we have similar concerns. Uh, also, the idea that your work is not about things, but about how things are in conversation with the world. And I think that that's what makes the greatest pictures. So I'm, I'm honored to share the stage with you today. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's uh, my, the honor is mine. And yeah, I'm glad we came across me too. When I get to Israel, I have to talk to you. We'll have to get together. Well, you have to stop in, in London first. Oh, I'm you're in London? London. I'll but, stop uh, there too. Great. <laughs> Why don't you stop in Pilsen, uh, all of you? <laughs> yes, we'll stop in Pilsen first. That's right. <laughs> Uh, Hinek, um, I, I sort of want to uh, go, go back to you just briefly because um, uh, the, the way that Rui uh, talks about sort of the idea of uh, an American road trip, w and in some way I was suddenly also thinking like, well, if a road trip becomes something idealized, then uh, it indeed becomes a performance and no road trip can actually be an original one. Um, so I, I very much like this idea of this, this you know, um, is it uh, a format? And if a format can be um, reproduced, it can also be marketed and it can be sold. And then the, the whole idea of an American road trip becomes just, you know, something you apply to or you just, you know, buy this experience or whatever, which is very much Las mm -hmm. Vegas, by the way. And um, uh, in, in your installation, Hinek, uh, uh, we also briefly uh, talked about it, uh, you know, the image of Los Angeles. And mm -hmm. um, can you say something about it? Because it, it really taps into the narrative of, uh, of uh, Rui and, and uh, Jay, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah we, I, I remember we had really good conversation um, before, before you actually opened the show. And I think, um, I mean, as with other, every other work, I'm always trying to go from very personal experience to something perhaps um, general. And uh, what, uh, this image was actually triggered by uh, just my uh, memories of uh, uh, my uncle living in uh, Los Angeles since ever, 
since I was born, he he uh, escaped Czechoslovakia back then, and he was living in Los Angeles. So for me, for uh, the first uh, 15 years of my life, um, Los Angeles was this sort of idea, really uh, American idea of uh, wealth, happiness, uh, fame, I suppose. Um, and then I uh, I actually lived in states for a while. We we talked about that, and uh, I actually never got to go to to L.A. And I kind of like this this idea of uh, uh, never seeing the space or um, um, never seeing the city, and and having this imagination. So when when I was thinking about this piece that I did for uh, for the gallery. Uh, it was really about this sort of projection screen of all of these sentiments, all of this, like, um, uh, for me, uh, the poster remains uh, uh, a projection screen, exactly as you're talking about the road trip as a, as a simulacrum, as something that doesn't exist, uh, and you, you sort of, you just, um, you just uh, fly through that. Uh, this is the same thing. This is something that doesn't exist doesn't exist. It doesn't, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, for one, it's a 40 years old picture. Uh, for a second, it, it, it's just uh, extremely subjective. And I like this idea of creating a projection screen uh, or image that um, sort of contains all of this. Um, and of course, there's another thing that uh, um, um, I always relied on my imagination when I was smaller. So this whole image is uh, heavily um, sort of inspired by this um, child, uh, childhood imagination. And I always thought that the sun was essential there. But then the picture itself is uh, extremely foggy, I mean, or smoggy, actually. Um, so you, uh, it's got some element, it's got like a filter that uh, sort of adjusts this whole idea of what it is. Uh, which for me was then quite um, quite um, interesting experience. Thank you, Hinek. Well, I, I mean, uh, before we we uh, um, uh, met in in the Sutnar Gallery, I indeed mentioned yeah. that I, in the, in the time that I, <coughs> sorry, in the time that I lived in Los Angeles, uh, which was really very interesting yeah. because before I moved to LA, I had no idea what LA uh, was. I mean, the only the only thing that I knew that uh, it was something with gang violence. Um, and pr police brutality, uh -huh. but, but this was based on uh, Rodney King, which is something that happened in the 1970s, if I'm not wrong. So this no, was... Be 1992. 92, okay. So anyway, it's a long, long time ago. And um, I was really interested in, uh, in going to Los Angeles. Um, and I lived in Venice Beach, very, very close to, to, uh, to the ocean. And uh, this this sort of also connects to what what uh, the work of Jay in the in the context of Las Vegas being a sensational, artificial, and the, the repetition of this. Um, so living in in uh, Venice Beach, that close to the ocean, you live actually near the board, boardwalk, um, and uh, it, it you know the first time that I went there, it was interesting. It was fascinating. Like wow, I'm in Los Angeles, I'm going to uh, the beach and the ocean, etc., etc. You have the palm trees, you have the nice weather, etc. But then you start to notice that, um, uh, well, first of all, it's, it's, uh, there's very, very um, uh, strong uh, contrasts. You have the wealthy, you have the luxury, and you have Skid Row. You have um, uh, the lost angels who basically camp out on the, on the beach. And living there in Venice Beach, um, Every weekend it becomes sort of like a circus, like you have live music, you have markets, you have this, you have that, like there's uh, sensations, there's uh, some kind of party, then people get some, you know, get a bit drunk, then there's a fight, and it's like, wow, the first time you, you are in this or you experience this, it's, wow, it's a lot of images. But then the next weekend is exactly the same, there's a circus, music, uh, uh, street musicians, whatever, uh, drunk people fight, and then it ends again. And the weekend after, it's again the same thing. Um, I think it's very, very interesting, sort of this, how um, an idea of a place completely changes when you actually are in the place. And not only uh, as a tourist or like as a visitor um, uh, for a brief moment of time, but sort of 
integrating into this place, how it completely, completely changes. I, I'm, I'm not sure, Hinek, but um, based on what you said, you should probably never go to Los Angeles to uh, keep intact this, uh, this idea that you have about Los Angeles. That, okay, um, that was sort of a question. Well, it, um, <laughs> was it? Um, um, I would love to go, but uh, uh, in the same moment as I, as I was trying to uh, explain this thinking about infrastructures and then uh, for me, uh, there's so much embedded in, in the aerial image of Los Angeles. Um, so it, it actually shows the real infrastructures, the highways and all of that. Um, it doesn't show the social uh, depth that you're talking about. Uh, but then in the same moment, um, uh, the whole idea was based on this experience of uh, duality in the world, like the first world and the second world, or uh, Iron Curtain, some sort of division. That could perhaps relate to the thinking of boundaries that you were talking about. Uh, but um, uh, it was very much about uh, trying to tap into a certain sentiment. And I would... Uh, I. I um, I'm almost imagining that if I go now to Los Angeles, it's uh, it's just not it's just going to be entirely different experience. It's going to be I'm going to have a feeling of uh, being in another city. Um, so um, um, uh, I'm trying to say that yes, again, it is a certain simulacrum. It's uh, it's probably a, a more of an idea of a city uh, or a place uh, rather than actual. Um, um, actual thing. Um, so I've, I would love to go. I would love to go to Los Angeles. And I, I feel like the, 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 um, uh, the idea that you are talking about, that I should never actually see uh, the image uh, that I could somehow undermine, um, I'm sure it's going to stay because it's just going to be two Los Angeles. You know, if I can jump in here one second, I, I, it's fascinating, this idea that the world is never what you expect it to be. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, you know, it just isn't. And I think in photography is even more of an example of that, because no matter how we conceive of the world, the act of photography transforms it so uniquely and so radically that, in fact, it doesn't really bear, it bears some resemblance, but it certainly is not an analog of the real world. It's not an actual representation. It's very much a controlled, constructed um, statement mm. on the part of the photographer. And it, you know, photography begs all these questions. I'm, I, and I'm thinking now about this idea of borders and boundaries in relative to the practice of photography itself. And you mentioned this earlier, you know, um, in some ways, the exhibition and symposium really is about how photography defines the border and how our activity as photographers defines the border, much more than the borders themselves. It has to do with our definitions, um, which, you know, is fascinating in and of itself. Again, it's about agency and how photographers always cross over. I also think it's interesting, we're talking about the road trip, and I myself have this difficulty a lot because I mean, I've gone all over the world making photographs, but there's always a question in my mind, am I just being superficial? Am I just going someplace? And, you know, for a day, I see a couple of things that look good together. I make a photograph, even though I can say I spent four hours making the photograph, it's only four hours. It's not 40 years. And if I were mm -hmm. there for 40 years, I'd be making a very different kind of photograph problem. Um, Absolutely. So the photographer themselves is always questioning, I think, um, the legitimacy of the activity, the photograph, what right or what boundary am I crossing over? How, as an American, what right do I have to go to south of Italy and Calabria and make value judgments based on that landscape? But this is the nature of the beast. I think photographers have always been voyeuristic in many ways, even intimately. We are, even if we are there forever, we are still our job is to be separate on some level. As much as we try to be personal, I think we always have a separation from the world. Mm. So the action of a, of a photographer themselves mm -hmm. is a boundary issue uh, all the time, all the time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely uh, rely to this feeling of uh, 
uh, how you how you described it like uh, almost like something is fake like I spent years working in Israel with a very familiar landscape, but I would wait for a very, very, or go back to a place for a very specific moment in time and uh, light and weather condition to capture this place in a very, very specific light that is alienated to the place itself, 99% of the time of its existence or visual appearance. Uh, so in a way, yeah, I think it is in the core of being a photographer or, uh, I don't know, visual artist. Like there's this uh, trick that you can apply that have to do with light and composition and a moment in time that basically erase everything else about this place in that time, mm -hmm. which is why photography is so strongly used to describe things, but also why you should be very wary of it, that it's not reality and almost have nothing to do with reality. Um, mm -hmm. It's interesting, I guess, that you feel that and I feel the same. And I guess for you, Heinrich, it, it's, also, it's also like, I guess everyone dealing with photography have this question if you're seriously engaging with the medium. Mm. Um, I have, uh, like, when we are talking about a road trip and all these kind of things, uh, uh, I have this experience, uh, which is, I think, um, very uh, European or very typical for a European visitor of the United States, uh, because now we have uh, these, like, this uh, visual uh, culture, and it's uh, the, the, the American um, uh, society, landscape, cityscape is so well documented and so well uh, visualized and and we have so many experiences through the media etc uh, that it's for me it's always very different uh, experience visiting the United States than any other corner of uh, of the world uh, because mm. uh, United States is for me a constant déjà vu in a, in a way. I always experience whether it's the interior, whether it's a hotel, whether it's a, uh, whatever. I have somehow experienced it through the eyes of somebody. Uh, it could have been uh, it could have been Hitchcock, it could have been Jarmusch, it could have been mm. uh, Spielberg. Uh, but it is present there, and it's very much different from visiting other places. Uh, if it's uh, uh, Israel, I'm, 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 I don't have these these feelings of uh, being in an in an uh, in a space where I which which is well in in a way well known for me. So that's also kind of very uh, and and it makes me it's it's very hard for me. For example, um, I think harder for me to work in the United States or to find something for me in the United States uh, to focus on uh, because I have all these images already stored in my head. So um, yeah. about kind of <laughs> these are very special boundaries uh, for me as artist uh, visiting the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing is the idea of the insider versus the outsider. Is there a difference? Um, you know, when I go to Italy to shoot, I am definitely an outsider. My question is always, am I really looking at this place differently than I would look at another place? And it's always a challenge for us as photographers, and we have to make it personal. If you start relying on anything that, that is based in a stereotype or some kind of referencing beforehand, you're going to lose your authenticity anyway. And I think this is a trap that many image makers fall into. We, we start to rely on certain uh, stereotypes and certain kinds of iconography that we think people want to see or will recognize, when in fact, I think it's just the opposite. Ours has to be a search for those things. Uh, and I think it's, it's traditional in the photographic medium that our job is to show people things that either they have not seen before or things that they, they have seen in ways that they have not seen it before. So this is where I really think our job is. Um, I don't think you can ever avoid photographing a thing that has not been photographed before. That, and especially in the United States, God knows everybody and their mother thinks that they're a documentarian or they're an artist or whatever. So all you can do is just stay, you know, I think uh, sincere to yourself. And I think then you're okay.
That's my view. Otherwise, I wouldn't make any photograph anymore. Uh, for me, it's uh, it's quite interesting uh, what Wojciech just mentioned, this, uh, this sort of familiarity of the US or um, perhaps also other places, but uh, we keep talking about US and um, uh, so it's a good example. And um, I feel like that there's this layer of uh, permanent nostalgia um, embedded. And for me, th this is super interesting. Maybe Maybe this is also another another case for thinking about the boundaries like where is the uh where where the real experience and the nos nostalgic feelings actually divide or how they overlap and and how far you have to go to get away from nostalgia or how far you have to get, go to actually feel nostalgic and i i feel like the us actually always produces this sort of sensation or uh, feeling um and and also, I feel like this is a part of the discussion we had about the image of the um, uh, of Los Angeles. That uh, mm, I think I was uh, since I actually bought this uh, picture. Even though I I really enjoy taking pictures uh, sometimes, I could not have taken this one. Uh, so I bought it, and uh, um, I feel like this sort of recognition of the. Uh, strong uh, nostalgic um, uh, layer of the image is part of the work. Uh, so I, I actually quite enjoy uh, sort of exploring uh, how moving it is or how uh, exactly familiar it is, um, um, uh, how new it is compared to now, even though it's old. Maybe that's also another thing. But you've still made it your own and that's what makes your work so unique. I've, I've made it my my own because I've I've completely different stories. So well, I've um, um, yeah yeah exactly. I, I was trying to work with my own story, and um, um, yeah, absolutely. No, the United States is a victim of its popular culture. I don't know that it's been enhanced because of its. Sorry, culture. I lost the connection. Uh, and so the idea of uh, uh, the real story versus the uh, plastic story is always. Uh, is always a conflict here in the States. And, uh, um, you know, I mean, I love it that you're dealing with popular imagery and then you repurpose yeah. it and find it. And I think that's what really uncovers the myth of the American culture, that it is truly just a, a facade. And if you can take those images, which we think are so important to our idea of a place and undercut them and de uh, deconstruct them, then we are telling mm -hmm. people, be careful about what images do and what you think of. That's a good thing. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Jay, uh, Hinek, and Rui for uh, joining us in the, in the discussion. I uh, received the news that we are going offline in a, in a few minutes. Uh, so this will be also the official end of our uh, symposium of today. This would actually be the moment that we go out to a restaurant and have a couple of drinks and talk about these subjects. But, you know, um, yeah, uh, maybe yeah. maybe in a couple of... <laughs> uh, Hinek, you can still make it to, uh, to Pilsen if you want. Um, you can be here in a, an hour yeah. and a half. But um, let's say that next year we, uh, know, we, can, we can meet each other uh, in person and, and uh, continue our conversations. It was very, very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yes, it was really nice. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you Enjoy for your me. drinks. <laughs> Thank you from uh, me as well and to all the other participants and um, I'm afraid now is the moment that we will be uh, looking at the uh, back at the symposium of uh, this year with, nos with nostalgia. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs>